22 Good morning. We're in day nine. Good morning. Good morning. We're in day nine. Wow, we got to work on our timing. We're in day nine. How are we doing this morning? Doing good, 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 Sam. Good, Sam. Good, 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 Sam. Every day this class makes me laugh. So, hey, you know, I, we, we record this and then I edit it. And the way that I edit the morning is I blank everything out. I fade in, and then you hear me say, good morning, new higher class, blah, 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 blah. And then you guys say, good morning. And what you guys do is before I even get through the intro, you're like, hey, good morning, blah, 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 blah. We got to work on our timing, okay? We only got one more day. So tomorrow is the big day. It's our last day together. Can you believe it? Can we get those cameras on? Alex Carr, Amber Prieto, Angelica, Marcella, Lewis, Levon, Danielle, and Dennis. I'm working on it, Sam. I'll be there in just a second. I appreciate that. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah, give me Dad, one second. Let me tell you, I miss you already. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> You're like, I'm done with Sam. I don't ever want to see him again. <laughs> because if you don't see me again in a formal training class, it means you're making money. <laughs> That's a good, good sign. <clears throat> anyway, so let me put up uh, the DRB. Uh, oh, my gosh. Yeah, Amber. Okay. I hear you. Uh, let's, uh, I'm going to put up the DRB for everybody. Please fill that out. And I'm trying to arrange for some folks to join our panel today. But remarkably enough, I haven't gotten one bit of feedback yet. So we still have time, though. It's not over yet. <clears throat> we'll give it a shot. All right. Anyway, so who made calls yesterday? Anybody? Oh, Yala, Sean, Logan, Julie, Amy, and I only see one more. Justin and Raphael. Okay, awesome. Did anybody observe a sale yesterday? Okay, we saw a sale. That's good. What was the largest sale that we saw, Gabriella? What did you see? Oh, Gabriella. Gabriel. I'm sorry, I was filling out the DRV. It was $75. Yeah. $75? $75,000. Okay, so that would be a record. <laughs> How much ALP did you see sold? Maybe that's the better way to put it. Uh, I don't remember. Okay. Was it a husband and wife? 1900 Yeah, it was husband and wife. Okay, I'm sorry. And who said something else? I did. I seen one for eighteen hundred. Eighteen hundred. Okay, so eighteen hundred so far is the top. Anybody else see a sale over eighteen hundred? No. Okay. So for those of you that actually observe sales, what was done differently than what you've been taught in this class? Okay. Um, the guy that I observed, he only presented them with two presentations instead of, or I'm sorry, two deals instead of three. Uh -huh. And he made one uh, extremely high and then one around the average, which was like, I think four bucks or something like that mm -hmm. per person. But other than that, it was pretty much all the same. So why do you think he did what we call an option close with just two options? Uh, well, he made one really high that he felt, I don't know, I guess that's just his sales tactic. He basically puts one and then tells the person that he doesn't even recommend it because it's too high and that he gives them the, the one that was much lower and it's a lot easier to close it doing it that way. Right. Except you always, 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 always will push down, right? From a sales mentality, when you do an option close like that, you put something very high to make the one very low look very attractive. You may close those, absolutely, but you're always pushing your ALP down. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, but like the one that was high was like really high. It was like ten dollars a day per person. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he's using he's using the age old technique of this one's ridiculous out of the realm of possibility, but I'm gonna give you something that's very reasonable. Right? Yeah, and the other one was like three fifty per person a day or something along those right. lines. Is that what you would have done on that sale? Probably not. What would you have done? What she taught us? Uh, 
So just to be clear, I teach you this in a certain way so that we can learn how to use EAP, I'm sorry, learn how to use HP Pro to build different plans and different options. Every upline has kind of the way they do it, so to speak. But I can tell you that AO International has the highest ALP per sale. And the way they have the highest ALP per sale is not by going super high and then showing very low, right? If we listen to Eddie yesterday, what did he do? Go very high and then sell down, but sell down so you have plenty of room, right? That's how Eddie does it, and Eddie does it very, very high. Yes, Sonal, what do you got for me? Yes, sir. Uh, I actually have uh, two presentations with veterans today, and I was just going to say what I try to do is I actually spend a little bit more time in the intro part, kind of going over the AIL Plus, you know, the Glick RX, uh, McGruff kids, kind of just spending more time building rapport and value about the stuff we're giving to them. So you have veteran presentations and you're going to show them two additional non-qualified benefits. Yes, sir. Why are you doing that? Uh, I don't know, sir. <laughs> I mean, you must I think have that's the reason, first time right? I've given you that answer. You, you didn't learn it from me. No, so you I must didn't. have got it from your upline, right? So why Correct, would your sir. upline have you pitch uh, two non -qual I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying anything wrong with it. I'm just asking you the rationale for why you're doing it. Uh, it was to my understanding that they qualify for these. Everybody qualifies for free stuff, so no. Exactly. Okay. So knowing that everyone qualifies for it, we could have taught you to do all that. Why would your upline have you pitch something that's not part of the class? Why do you think that is? Or is it just you making that decision? No, I was uh, told to do this. Who's your upline? Amanda, sir. Okay. So we're having, so Amanda's having you pitch two additional pre-qualified or what we call no cost benefits, right? So you're spending time on the front end saying, hey, here is your McGruff kit, right? And the people you're selling to, do you know how old they are? Yes, sir. The McGruff kit's not for, it's not for them, but I'm like, you know, you extract the information. I already know they're like, or I got like, you know, their family that they have children and grandchildren. So you're doing it for the grandchildren, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So that's going to give you the parents' names, I would assume, correct? Yes, sir. And are you not going to get the parents' name when you fill out the family information guide? Uh, I am going to get the, that information. Okay. So tomorrow you have to tell us how that goes. So here's the thing for everybody, right? You can pitch all the stuff that's no um, pre-qualified benefits on the left-hand side of HP Pro. You can hit more. If everyone's following what I'm saying, you get a list of all these things yeah, that you that can stuff. do, right? The issue is I haven't shown you how to actually properly pitch, not, not you, Snell, but just in general, right? I haven't shown you how to pitch the McGruff uh, thing because there's a lot more that goes into the McGruff. There is the digital version of McGruff. Did she show you that? Did she give you the QRT code that you need to give to them to activate their kits? Did she show you that? Uh, relatively, sir. There's just I just took a lot of notes and I was kind of just writing down everything. Uh, so do you have your own QRC code that will activate the kits? Uh, you would know if you got your own QRC codes because you have to go on the planet to get it. Have you done that? Um, I don't think so, sir. Yeah, so if you haven't done it, every single time that that particular client gives a QRC code to somebody else to activate, we get those leads. If it's not your QRC code, where do those leads go? To somebody else. See what I'm saying? So... Again, these are good things, but make sure, guys, because you're right at the point of being released. Any work that you're doing now, making calls for somebody else to try to close a deal, you want to get the goodness from those calls. Does that make sense? So, Sanal, do you have your agent license yet? Yes, sir. So you're, you, you've, you can actually sell something through EAP. You can log in through EAP and under your own name for the state that this client's in today, you could actually sell them yourself. Uh, no, it would be a code because I don't have the, I don't have the license for the state that they're in. Ah, ah, so follow with me, everybody. If you don't have a code, I'm sorry, if you don't have a license in the state that you're doing this for, and you're going to do the McGruff pitch and you're going to give a QRC code, it's not going to be yours, which means all the leads from that code goes to somebody else. 
So, so now you tell me, is that legitimately fair to you if you're doing all the heavy lifting? No, sir. Well, you make that call, whether it's fair or not. I'm just pointing out to you that you're all about to become released agents. Everything that you do has value now, right? So you make 300 calls throughout the course or throughout the length of this course, and you're not making calls on your own lead pack. You're making calls for somebody else, right? Every time you make a call and book an appointment and that appointment turns into a sale, that person's lead pack is value to them, correct? So yes. now you guys are right at the point where you're going to be making calls. That value needs to come back to you. And I don't want to harp on this forever, but I just want to point out to you that you are all valuable. You're valuable to me. You're valuable to AO International. You need to value yourselves and your time. Because after Friday, everything that you do, in my opinion, you should get some benefit from once you're released. If you haven't been released, different story. Once you're released, everything you do has value. Yes, Angelica. Yes, I just want to say that, you know, keeping your referrals while you're training with your upline is important because that helps you build your personal lead pack. So that way you have referral sales to do as well. So absolutely, Angelica, you're, you're dead on. So here's what happens. I know you're sitting there, you're making these calls, you get an appointment, they go, hey, jump into the appointment. You're going to do the presentation pitch. And Sam was like, that's awesome. I go through the family information guide. I go through the McGraw Prime. I go through GlickRx. I go through AIL, all the stuff they have me do, right? Mm -hmm. And these people are like, hey, here's all the names. Here's all the names. What happens to all those names? You're filling out the family information guide. You're writing down all that information, right? Where do they go? What are you doing with them? Well, you're Somebody putting them closed. into the system. You're putting them into the system for who? You're putting it in for the person that you're doing the pitch for or you're doing it for yourself? You're, well, if you're just going to be pitching for somebody else, you're actually providing more value to their lead pack and building their business bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. They're, you know, feeding off the fruit of your labor. So, you know... You don't have to be greedy and so direct about, you know, wanting your referrals to build your personal lead pack. But we have to keep in mind that we're also invested in building our own business and we're allowed yes. leads from AO, but it's also an expectation from AO for us to provide our own resources. So let me put a little bit of a different spin. Angelica, I think you're a thousand percent correct. If you were to keep the referrals that you generated, you're not being greedy, you're being smart. Because new hires only get so many leads. People who've been in the business that have demonstrated they can do really well, they get flooded with leads, but they also generate a lot of referrals, okay? We know that there's so many <laughs> leads that are created, we don't have enough agents. But on top of that, we know the close rates hire for referrals, we know the show rates hire for referrals, and the ALP is about the same. So referrals are the name of the game. If you generate a referral, on a presentation that you're in, whether it's someone else's lead you're doing the presentation for or not, you want to keep those referrals. Okay? And again, don't mistake my passion. I want all of you to win. I've led sales teams for years. And the worst thing that I see ever happen is when we hire new people, whether it's AIL, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Facebook, when salespeople generate leads and other people take them. Say, thank you very much. Appreciate your time and effort. <laughs> you are putting in the time and effort. Let's make sure you get the compensation. Yes, Jerry, what can I do for you? I was going to say, I was going to say that that's exact. I made my first sale yesterday and got 11 refs from it. And mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's the arrangement that I had with my upline. I said, hey, I'm going to keep this and say, yeah, they're yours. Who's your upline, Jerry? Eddie Leon. Eddie. So you did a lead for Eddie? Uh, yeah, he had me run the presentation and everything. So that's what I did. And and um, when we nice. went to the person, and when you said, I want to keep the referrals, what did he say? He said, yeah, they're yours. Yeah, yeah, they're yours. You did the work, right? Yeah. There should not be one leader in this organization that if you do a presentation on their behalf, that they don't at least, at least at minimum, give you the referrals that you generate. Because they didn't do it. You did it. And as you become leaders and you build your teams, I want you to think the same way, that all of you were in this spot at one point and you were scrabbling to get released, to do the presentation rubric, to go through two weeks with Sam, which I know is not very comfortable for everybody. And then finally you get released and someone is saying, yeah, give me all the referrals you generate on the presentations you make for me. Sean Festimal, 
You're a senior guy. Are you going to yes, give sir. the referrals to somebody making a uh, presentation on your behalf? I always do. Always there have. you go. See, that's a good man right there. That's what should happen. Now, I'm not saying go back and blow up your uplines. Now, don't get me wrong. Everybody has a different way of doing it. I just want you to think in your mind, I have value. I'm bringing value to the organization. I've gone through two weeks of training. Why not me? I'm going to put a slogan. Why not me? Anyway, I'm going to get off my high horse. Uh, Stephen Plamento, I can't believe you don't have a comment. And we're already what? 18 I, minutes in the class. I'm not, I'm not my I'm not myself today, Sam. I don't know what's wrong with this. There's clearly something wrong with me. Okay. Well, I can't tell you. We'll get that fixed. All right. Uh, ask, me, ask me to role ask me to role play with you like yes. No, no, because you role play mean. I, Eddie had I, I, I would yesterday. not mean. I would create him, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> hey Jerry, your sale that you said you had, that was under your agent number um no that's the other thing that was on there eddie's agent number okay so you got you should tell eddie hey give me some leads now after friday because obviously i can sell what are you waiting for yeah that's that's what we're doing there you go awesome. my, my license that. came in today so i i'm ready to go i'm all set anyway hey i'm uh, i'm proud of you that's great everyone I, i'm sure everyone i think said hey congratulations so that's awesome we're all going to get there we're all going to get our first sale it could be today it could be tomorrow it could be a weekend it could be next week don't despair never get discouraged it may take time for others it may come quick for other folks you're going to get there okay we're all going to get there okay sam can you send that form again <laughs> <laughs> no, Jerry, I'm, I'm not. Are you kidding me? You, you've been part of the class. It's in the chat. You know that, right? You can scroll up in the chat. No, no. I transfer the call from my phone to my computer and I cannot see. Thank you. Oh, oh. So because you were lacking, everyone else has to figure out how to help you out. All right, Jerry, I'm going to remember you. You're going on my list. It's not the naughty list for Christmas presents. It's my list. And when I fly out and sit down with Eddie Leon, we talk about his team. Your name's right there at the top. I do it on purpose. You never forget about me, Sam. Kimberly Carter. You look, the kid is so cute ever, right? Is that who oh, she is? Yeah. Ever? Nice. Yep. All right. It's her. Um, <laughs> so since Jerry did his presentation under Eddie's agent name, that uh -huh. means he's not going to get paid on it, right? That's correct. Oh, I'm sorry. That sucks. But that, even though that sucks, that's the right thing to do because Eddie actually has to book it under his name, right? Yeah, because yeah, because he can't Jerry rather can't actually conduct the sale by himself and book it. So he may not. Yeah, that's what happened with my first sale. I did um, 2300 ALP nice. with Ryan. Thank you. With Ryan Rutt. I'm sorry, Ryan Cummings. And <laughs> um, I only did the intro and he did the rest and then uh -huh. put it under my agent name because I had already had one. And so when we were finished, I was like, so how do I have you paid for it? And he was like, no, it's yours. And I was like, no, it's not. I didn't do that. And he's like, yeah, you did. And I was like, okay, no, I didn't, but thank you. You're saying that you did a presentation with Ryan at the well, end. I only did the only, intro. I understand you did some of it. And so Ryan then put the sale under your agent ID. Yeah. Well, then you're going to get paid on that. Right. That's what I yeah. was saying. Jerry won't. What's wrong with that? Nothing is wrong on my part. I just, right. I was making so, sure I So here's kind of the, Jerry. okay, cool. Thank you, Kimberly. Here's kind of the art, right, of what happens. Different leaders do different things. If I have someone and I sell something with them, if they're part of the call, guess what I'm doing? I'm going to give them the referrals. I'm going to give them the entire sale. And we'll find out today and tomorrow why I'm doing that, because partially is I'm getting paid no matter whether I take the sale or not. That person is getting me paid. That's number one. Number two, most people who come to this class and get their agent ID, you know what they want more than anything else? They want money. They want to get paid. So is it a bad thing for me to go, okay, I'm going to pay you out on that. I'm going to put in your agent ID. If you have an agent, an agent number, so to be clear, you have to be licensed and you have to have an agent number. If you the have one, I'm in it. on you, you're gold. If you don't have an agent number, do you think I'm still going to pay you? I will. Absolutely. I'm going to transfer you whatever that money is worth, whatever your comp is. 
So for all of us, right, we get paid 50%. We get credited 50% for the ALP. If the ALP is $1,000, right, you get compensated or you get credited 50%. So you get $500. And because you're new hires, you get 75% of that. So 75% of 500 is, come on, we're all in sales. We got to be quick. How much? 750, you said? Wait, you said 1,000? 75% of 500. Oh, my God. The ALP is $1,000. How much do you get paid? 375. Okay. So what I would do is I would transfer via Zelle or via Cash App or whatever, 375 to whoever the agent was that did the sale for me. Sam, when hold did on, that hold change? Hold on, hold on one second. That's what I would do. That's what some uplines do. Not all managers do that, and there's no requirement to do it. But the reason I do that is because how is Jerry going to feel if Jerry got three hundred seventy-five dollars in his bank account on Friday? Motivated referrals and everything else, he might feel pretty good, right? That little bit of extra that I'm going to do for him may be the difference in him going. You know what? I want to work on Saturdays too because now I want to get paid. I'm getting money. I just got three hundred seventy-five bucks in my account. Right. That's what I do for all of my people. Again, not everybody does that. And there's no requirement, there's no policy that says you have to do X, Y, and Z. But I know how I was treated when I came into this organization with Mario and his brother Ari and Julian Getz and uh, Christina Salvatore, all those people on that upline, they treated me one way. I make sure that I emulate that every single time I have a team member come work for me. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. It's dependent upon the leader. Okay, Sam, I'm going to get to you in just a second. Sean, as a senior leader in the organization, what do you got for me? Well, I have for you. No, I agree completely with what you're saying. I do the same thing for my people. There you I'm go. Awesome. Up. All right, Sandra, go. So, yeah, the uh, broker's license and agent number. Sometimes it seems like this, that the wording is used interchangeably and then maybe why some people think that when they're doing a sale with someone that they're getting that money directly. And if they don't have an agent number, if the sale wasn't done under the agent number, then they're not getting credit for that unless they do what you uh, do in your downline, transfer the money to them. Right. So, so let's make sure we're in agreement about how the process works. I apply for my state license I take the test or take a mandated training. I take the test. I pass. Now I have my license in the state of California. That's where I live. I yes. let AIL know, hey, I got my license. I send them a copy of it. AIL, or I let my upline know, my admin. My admin through AIL then sends communication to the state uh, insurance commissioner saying that I'm a captured agent and I represent them. Once they get the okay from the state that that's the case, they then issue me an agent ID or an agent number. Yes. Now, once I have that agent number, now the back end <laughs> in EAP needs to load that agent number properly within my hierarchy. And the way that I know that it's done properly is that I'll actually log into EAP under my own login and I'll see a state drop down for the first state that I'm a resident in. Mm -hmm. Once that happens, I can write business under my ID. Until right. that happens, even if I'm licensed, I still can't write business because AIL hasn't uh, formally recognized that I represent them in the state that I got the license in. I, I agree. I'm simply okay, saying perfect. that sometimes the, the, the terminology of broker's license or broker's number and agent ID, um, some people use those words interchangeably and they think that they, uh, they have an agent ID when there's something that comes later. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, so uh, brokers, we don't we don't call them brokers. We call them insurance licenses, right? Yeah. Brokers, I think, is for real estate and some others. Uh, but yeah, in Illinois, they better. call them brokers. Oh. In New York, okay. In so, Illinois, in Illinois, Illinois. Mm. all does. So the license the state issues you is different than the agent ID that American Income Life gives you. She's absolutely right. right. Absolutely. It takes time to get one after the other one has been provided. Yes, Crystal okay. Brock, what can I do for you? Uh, this is kind of like what you're bringing up now. I kind of brought up today with my upline, because as you say, every team is different, but mm -hmm. when you're on the same team, especially like, you know, if you spoke or had your interview with the main person and they say one thing and then continuity purposes, because when you've done this business before, and I did something similar to this 
um, already, but it had its way of working, kind of like how you said. And, you know, it was just something that I brought up, like when you're put under somebody else and they don't work that way. So, so you interviewed with this person. Yeah. And they brought you in. Are they are they still in the organization or were they just Oh yeah, they're still in the organization, okay. but you no know, continuity are they purposes, in? especially when you're in a big class like this and you run into someone else who's also under that same team, so to say, uh -huh. and you see different things happening. So I had asked, like, hey, do we have a team orientation packet? Because that was something when I was on another just just the break it down team. Sure. And we were all under the one person that, hey, this is how this organization works. Gotcha. I know everyone's different. Every company is different. But just from a, a an experience point of view and a kind of good faith point of view, I would, me personally, I would work it how it was done for Jerry as well as how it was done for you and many others in the class. Yes. But continuity wise, to me, that's a little... It comes off as a little skewed. And then like you say, the other person feels like they're being taken advantage of because it's like, hey, I'm helping this person out because I'm really good at setting appointments. But then yet, if you're not being brought in on those appointments to see how they run or like, hey, thanks for this. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it yes. kind of, that that excitement goes away. Like when I was the other team, I was like, hey, this is what we're doing. We're running together and this is, you know, and I see that going on for others. And then it's kind of like, hey, you put me under somebody that's like, maybe, maybe, you know, like you're still coaching. <laughs> and that's good, but you know what I'm saying? When you've, when you've so, had that and you've been a leader, mm -hmm. it's, it's a little yeah. different. I think the perfect uh, statement the that that is that in this business, you can move into leadership without necessarily having all the leadership skills, right? You're going to move up if you recruit and you're selling and you're going to bring people underneath you. It takes time in some cases for us to coach um, the leadership skills or to help have those folks develop leadership skills. So yes, I wish there was more of a continuity. That's one of the reasons that we have this class to begin with is because even before we got to the leadership problem, we knew we had an education problem, right? Because people were coming in and they were being trained 9 million different ways. And in a protected market like veterans, we can't have that. And then uh, going to my point about retention, you see the result of that because people bail out really fast because either they're not making money, they're not being taken care of by their leadership, et cetera, et cetera. Very important resource you can directly and professionally express your expectation. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Manage up everybody, manage up. Just because I'm the trainer, does that mean I know everything about uh, AIL, everything about insurance, everything about the veteran market? No. If what I'm doing isn't working for you, you can send me a direct uh, DM and say, hey, Sam, this, that, or the other. Do you think I'll take that feedback very well? Well, I'll tell you, I will take it back. I will take it well, because I want to do right by every one of us. Take that mentality, combine it with the fact that you know you have your own value, and work with your upline to say, hey, help me understand you know, this, that, or the other. Uh, can we do it differently? You know, and they'll give you, they'll work with you. Okay. Yes, uh, Alex Carr, what can I do for you? Yeah, is the 75% advance a new thing or an AO thing or or what? Because I was told 65% advance initially. So new hires have the first 30 days is 75% because you're not getting anything on the back end. So we can go through the comp uh, either later today or tomorrow. I have to look what it says on the schedule. But new hires in the first 30 days, you sell $1,000. You, everyone gets credit 50% of that. And then the way you get paid out of that 500 is you're going to get 75% all up front. Right. Once you get beyond the 30 days, then it's a, then your next contract usually is a 65, uh, 35, where you get paid 65% of the advance. The rest of the advance gets paid, I think, 60 days after the fact. And, the re and that's for everybody. And the reason yeah. why is because we know that if somebody who buys a policy goes and keeps paying that policy for at least three months, they usually pay for it over the year. Okay, yeah, yeah. So then the advance doesn't become a loss leader for the company. Right. But in your first 30 days, we wanna make sure anything you do sell, you get the immediate goodness. Now we're paying you 75%, which then means there's 25% of that commission just floating around. That gets paid out in the bonuses to the SAs who have people underneath them that ostensibly they're training every single day. So they then get a bonus package that's eligible to them. See, this is why I'm saying if you're an SA and you have people under you, 
Why take their sales? You're already getting paid the commission on the sales and you get a bonus on what they sell. So good leaders will understand that and make sure that people are taken care of. Does that answer your question, Alex? Yes. And after 30 days, we move to our personal 50% contract with 65% advance. And then from there, it goes up, obviously. And there it goes up time. depending on when you book a certain amount of money or yeah. uh, a certain amount of time of the business, et cetera, okay. et cetera. Yeah. Woo. Get off my soapbox this morning. Holy mackerel. See, I'm a little passionate about sales and coaching and leadership. All right. Any other questions before we dive into whatever the heck it is I'm supposed to be talking about today? I see no other questions. All right. Uh, let's go to Stephen. We'll pick on you. What am I doing today? What are you doing today? All right. Thursday, week two, agent success slash survival. I guess this means worksheet and guest speakers drop in survival and success panel Q&A. Well, that would be nice. Uh, they're not here yet nor they responded. So what else am I supposed to be doing today? Well, what else you're doing is, um, it looks like agent success slash survival, WS, I guess means worksheet. And then it says homework, prepare, prepare for release. Okay, let's go to page 26 on our uh, AO International New Agent Packet. And if you open that up and you take a look at it, you'll see <coughs> that we have EAP Q&A, and then the Agent Survival Guide. So we're going to go through a bunch of the websites. All right. And WS stands for Workshop. Ah, okay. So that was a definitely a good try. It could stand so, for a lot of things, though, but we're not going to talk So we're so going to you want that. a commentary, you asked for it. Oh, absolutely. But one thing I do notice is that I thank you for doing the uh, DRBs, but I have to take attendance. And since I'm not playing in a video and can look at everything, I'm just going to call the attendance. Uh, what happened here? I'm going to call the attendance um, verbally, okay? So just give me a second here to bring it up. And then we'll do that. And then we'll dive into the uh, ARC. And this is really good stuff. We'll talk about comp. We'll talk about all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> all right. Let's get you over there. Let's make this bigger and let's go to today. 1121. All right. So I'm just going to call it the name since I can't see anybody and we'll just go from there. Justin Heisha. Out here. <clears throat> you weren't here yesterday, right? Yeah, I was. You were? My yep. bad. Okay. Omar Salam. Yeah, I'm here. Connor Dunlap. Here. Sanal, I know you're here. Kai Kinsey. Julie Jenny, I know is here. Logan Berner, I know is here. Rebecca Whipple. <clears throat> Levon Robinson. I'm here. Andrew Kalar. Here. Laney Lozier, Tiffany Shelley, Crystal Brock. Yeah. Seth Bobbitt. Here. Nice. Uh, Yvette Allman, Jason Radford. Here. Thank you. Kimberly Carter, Amber Prieto, Elizabeth Huerta, Deanna, Deanna Forrester. Here. <laughs> I went too fast. All right, Kimberly Carter. Here. Amber Pareto. Here. Elizabeth Wortha. Here. Deanna Forrester. All right. Danielle Fluence. Here. Thank you. Yeah. Amy Cruz, I know you're here. Javon here. Ham. <clears throat> Rafael Vega. Here. Sandra is here. Ruben Lloyd. Here. Thank you, Skylar Beal, Adam Nemeth, Yamara Figueroa, Lanisha Paul, Steven is here, Ardit, Lakeisha Williams, no, okay, I think all these people are going to be here. Angelica Quintana, 
Yeah, you're here. I, I'm here. We just spoke. We did some heavy speaking. I know. I just. <laughs> Gabriella Preciado, I know, is here. Jean, are you here? Ricardo Navarre. Yes, I'm here. Jay, Jay Ricardo. Jay, Sen <laughs> Jay Senex Rivas. Here. Sean Festival. Here. Emily Bulo. Here. Emily is here. I'm nice. Here. Sheila Neal. Dennis Martai. I'm sorry. Sheila, was that you? No, Sheila's not here. She couldn't. Thank she's going to be in a little late today. Yeah, no worries. Alex Carr. Here. Nice. Dennis Brahahi. Here. All right. Dejare. Dejare. I always get the name wrong. Chelsea. Ruben. Rashad. Thank you, Ruben. Rashad. Logan. I already said that. Lewis Heath. Justin. Here. Uh, yeah, I'm here again. Thank you. I have your name twice. I don't know. Julie, Jason, and Jerry Sandoval. So Julie's here and Jerry's here. Okay, thank you very much. I tried to do that only uh, if absolutely necessary because it drives me crazy. Who cares about doing roll call? But your leaders will always want to know if you're here. All right, so we're going to go into the Agent Resource Center. So you guys can see my screen over here on the left. If I click on this button, the Agent Resource Center comes up. Your username and login is going to be the same one that you use to get into eApp if you have an eApp login. If you don't have an eApp login, then the Agent Resource Center, uh, I think it, in my email, I tell you what the login is. So let me go back here, let me compose. So I think there's a tentative email login that you all can use. Of course, my email is not coming up here. Okay. Sam, there is, I've used it. It's the training one. Awesome. Agent Resource Center, yeah. So the username is AIL and the password is AIL in or all in 2022 exclamation mark. So I'll put that in the chat. Some of you may have already done it. There you go. All right, so everyone can log in using that. So this is a uh, resource center and it's really, really important that we bookmark this and we have this available to us because there's a lot of information here that not everybody knows off the top of their head. So your leaders have used this extensively, agents use this extensively. It's always good for us to refer back to it. A lot of questions could be answered here and on the planet. So we're gonna go through the Agent Resource Center first. So when you log in, it comes up like this. First thing it shows you is the AIL uh, and National Income, kind of the store. So if I click on that, I can get uh, or purchase swag, right? In this case, it's at the Globe Life store. So if you wanted to buy any Globe Life uh, swag, you can from this location. There's gonna be another one specific for American Income and then one for AIL. So that's that, you have the Globe Achievement Awards, you got the trip to Cancun, you have the Spotlight Digital, which we're gonna see in a minute. We have some game speed here, we have the Leadership Academy. So this is at the top level for both American Income <coughs> and National Income companies. We're all part of AIL. Okay. Then you have company forms that are here. So when I click on this, it gives me the enrollment form for the Blue Cross enrollment. If you wanted to get reimbursed for your uh, health expenditures, you can do that here. And you've got instructions for agency payments. If you wanted to change your agency payment to go to a different one. For all of you, if you've signed your contract with American Income, then all of this would have already been filled out. And this is the location if you want to change that information. When we scroll down here, we can see the compensation plans for every role. So 50, 60, 62, 65, 67 for all the GAs. You guys are all on the 50. 
So when I click on that, you will get 50% payout. Now, this is not accurate. These numbers are actually higher now. <clears throat> so if you wanted to, you could take your Excel or your Google Sheets and you could actually calculate for everything that you sell exactly to the penny how much you should get compensated for it. But like I said, this information is antiquated. This was effective as of 2017. We're now in 2022. <clears throat> the numbers have only gone up. Okay. Uh, that's for Florida only if you're in Florida, New Zealand, et cetera, et cetera. And now you have your contract. So if you haven't signed your contract, this is what your contract would look like. And then the other contracts are there for the various roles that you can go into. So as an example, uh, Sean Festival, right? He has his agent contract and then he has his, he signed an SA contract and now he's signed a GA contract. Emily has an agent contract and signed a GA and signed, I'm sorry, an SA contract. So basically it gives you all the obligations, tell you everything that's going on, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Bunch of legalese in here. Okay. And your contract will have this, or I'm sorry, this is your contract. See where it says here, it talks about the uh, vesting. That's how it works for your renewals. So once you're here for 10 years, you get 100% vested. Every year you're here, it increases by 10%. So this tells you what you can and cannot do relative to your role as a uh, agent within American Income. You can buy stock with us if you want. There's a stock purchase program guide. You can click on that and you can open the PDF and actually put that together and buy yourself some of the stock from the company. Yes, Angelica. I had a quick question about contracting and signing at the bottom. Um, uh -huh. who's all, whose signatures do you expect to be on the bottom other than your own? Like your manager sends you to sign, you sign in two spots and date it, and then you send it back. Oh, I believe it's got to be an RGA or the SGA. RGA. And I don't remember off the top of my head what it is, but a, but a GA and an MGA can't sign on behalf of the company. So for example, uh, Sean can't sign for someone to be promoted to a SA. Okay, so it would be above Sean? Um, yeah, so Sean is a GA, then you have an MGA, then you have your RGA. So it's either gotta be the RGA, the regional general agent, or the SGA, the state general agent. All right, thank you. Yep, absolutely. So that's the company forms page right here. You have the CAS help desk. Uh, and this is the website for CAS. So if you have any problems trying to get to anything, you can click here and get some information. There's also eApp. So I know, is it Julie Jenny was having problems with eApp? If you click here on eApp, you can actually contact them directly and send an email to eApp help at AILife.com. And they will help you through that process. It tells you the minimum requirements for having eApp loaded onto your computer. And it says, hey, can I run it on a Mac? Yeah, absolutely. But now you got to contact your local certified IT technician, <laughs> basically because you have to emulate the Windows environment on a Mac. All right, so that's there for us. Then you have contact. Uh, if you need help on any one of these issues, there's your phone number. So you have the claims department. I think somebody the other day said that, uh, I think it was you, Jerry, right? So I think if somebody had a claim or had an issue, you can give them the phone number to contact. Absolutely, you definitely can do that from a claims perspective. Uh, my best practice though, is that everything goes through you. Because if you help somebody out when they have a loved one that died, they're gonna remember that and they're gonna talk about it to anybody else. And that's the best credibility that you can ever give, right? Is that you were available at the worst time in their life. It's not pleasant for you, but if you've done a good job in terms of selling them a product that's going to alleviate the pain and suffering to a certain extent, they're never going to forget that. <clears throat> okay. Then you have policy issue department, POS department for those who already actually have a policy, and then the underwriting department. You can give these folks a call. Guaranteed, you're probably not going to get through the first time. So you might want to send an email and ask some questions. And so they can follow. <clears throat> okay. Then you've got uh, glossary. So these are terms that I may have used. You may hear somebody else use. Here's what they mean. a &H, accident and health, uh, uh, decline, application is deemed possibly uninsurable before it's sent to Waco, uh, bill with. So bill this policy with an existing policy. 
CWA, cash with application, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Managing agent and training is called a MAT, monthly bank draft. We saw that on the app, right? A monthly, quarterly, annual ABD, it's a build bank draft. Uh, PVD, peripheral vascular disease. So this by no means is a comprehensive list of every acronym we use, but it is a good start. So you can always check here to see if in fact, uh, something you don't know here. And if you don't know it and you ask your SA or GA, they're probably gonna know. Okay. So that's everything across the top here. Now let's start looking on the left-hand side. So insurance is run by actuaries. And actuaries are people who calculate risk pretty much, right? They have a bunch of information to bring it in, they calculate the risk, and they're the ones who help set the pricing for our products to the market. So if you click on actuary, it says here, P. Miller, AI, Law. that's the actuary. You can get rate sheets, outlines of coverage, applications, replacement forms, everything like that. But I would tell you <clears throat> that HP Pro has all the information that you're looking for relative to rates themselves. If you have specific questions about how a rate is arrived at or just want to get some more information about the insurance products we sell, you can send an email to these guys and get that information. Okay. Again, your upline should have a lot of knowledge about the products that are being sold. But if you want to go beyond what they may know, this is a way you can do it. You can also go online uh, and look up information about AI, American Income Life and the products that we sell, and you'll get a lot of information about that. Speaking of which, and you're going to see that I'll do this a lot. I'll jump around to various things. Let's talk about the products that we sell. So whole life, we know we sell a whole life product, right? And we label it as the freedom of choice. There's a whole bunch in here. We talked about the different tiers. They call them bands, whole life, preferred, executive, and select. The issue age is from zero to 80 with 60 to 80 going to a senior graded face amount from 1,000 up to 34,999. I have plenty of times sold products to seniors for only $1,000 on the whole life side because I demonstrated the value of the A71 product. And that's the one that they wanted, even though they had other coverage. So there's ways to get additional revenue out of people, uh, even though you're not selling a huge whole life policy. Whole life builds cash value and never, expire, never expires. The rates are level for the entire duration. And if you use tobacco, then the rates do get uh, modified upward uh, for tobacco use. We also sell a 10 year renewable and convertible term so for those 10 years, the cost is exactly the same. If you go into HP Pro and you click the same amount, say $50,000 <clears> for whole life and then $50,000 for the 10-year RNC, you're going to see that the RNC is a lot less expensive. But it's fool's go because what ends up happening, if you as a person that, you know, you bought that policy or bought both of them, the whole life product stays the same throughout the entire duration that you're paying for it the 10-year RFC will jump up on the renewal of the 10-year and it automatically renews. So if you do nothing, the price will go up and we'll just bill you the greater amount. It says all of that in the fine print. The thing about a 10-year RFC though is, is no cash value is generated based on what you're paying into it. So every dime you put into a term life policy has no value unless you actually die. Yes, Stephen. Okay. Um, just be very careful that notation approved in all states and provinces. Just so you all know, AIL cannot sell in New York. So if you ever do get a referral, you need to go external and contact Globe, Globe Life to get an agent to sit down with, you know, Janie's father-in-law in New York. All states doesn't mean New York. Right. So in the, you're absolutely right. So in the context of this, it, it, we've already assumed that we've told that we don't sell in Massachusetts and we don't sell in New York. So when we say in all states, it's all states that AIL sells into. Now, within that context of the 48 states, there's certain products that we don't sell and there are certain products we do sell. And you'll find that out when you try to sell them or when you try to present them in uh, HP Pro you won't be able to present a particular type of product like A71 at a certain age in certain states isn't allowed to be sold. But in terms of the bigger picture, yes, we do not sell in New York nor in Massachusetts. Yes, Gabriella, bring it. 
So the 10-year RC, that one is the one that we use as paycheck protection, right? But would we ever sell this by the by itself without a whole life? Sure, you could, absolutely. But if you think about what we're doing in terms of the insurance that we're providing, if you sell this by itself, you're selling a portfolio to somebody that you know is not necessarily going to cover them completely. So okay. basically, I if this has ever happened, it's because the client has convinced me that they're not going to buy the whole life product whatsoever. What I usually do is I combine this product with the whole life so that I address the needs, as you said, income protection, paycheck protection, things like that. But, but forget about the protections for just a second. You can sell this to virtually anybody that you want. The price is a lot lower. You don't make as much money on this particular product, right? And they're not generating any cash value. So at the end of five years, if they say, hey, I don't want it anymore, then all the money they put into it is gone. Whereas if you have a whole life product, all the money you put into that, there's going to be some cash value that's been created that you're eligible to get returned to you. Okay, so, so yeah. we are able to, but it just wouldn't make sense in our case, right? Well, no, I'm not saying it wouldn't make sense. I'm saying it's less likely that it's providing the best possible portfolio for your client if all you sell them is a, a term policy. You definitely could do it. There's nothing that says that you can't. But in your mind, if you know you're not going to get paid as much on a term policy, why would you not spend the extra time to convert somebody or have them uh, buy a whole life policy? So okay. and I'll get to you in just one second, Angelica. So uh, what a lot of agents do, because I sell POS a lot, what you'll find in a POS is that newer agents will say, oh, okay, I want to sell $100,000 to you, okay? But you can't afford $100,000 a whole life because it costs up here, right? So I'm sitting there and I go, well, I still want to be covered for $100,000 if I die because you convinced me that we need to protect my home. So I want mortgage protection. So the agent goes, okay, no problem. I'm going to sell you $25,000 a whole life to bring that cost down. And then I'm going to add in a 10-year RNC and that'll be $75,000. And the cost for that is less per month than it is for the whole life. So me as the buyer, I'm thinking, okay, I have $100,000 of coverage. Even if you didn't explain it correctly, what did I tell everybody? That when you use HP Pro, the number that sticks in people's head is the number in red that gets paid out, that big number, remember? So in my example, even though I told the person they got $25,000 of whole life and $75,000 combined to create $100,000, that $75,000 is in term life in my head, I think I have $100,000 in coverage. Everyone tracking with me so far? Then uh, Gabriella comes along a year later and contacts the lead because it's a POS or an existing policy owner and says, hey, took a look at your policy, you know, uh, and I noticed that you have $100,000 of coverage. That's great. Did you understand that only 25% of that is guaranteed to be paid out? And the client goes, well, what do you mean? Well, here's what happens. Whole life, no matter how you die, no matter when you die, that will always pay out. But the $75 in the term will only pay out if you die within that 10 year period. Sam, you're only 35, the likelihood that you're gonna die in that 10 year period is pretty low. The average lifespan for you is gonna be about 70. So you got another 35 years, which means the 10 year renewable convertible is going to increase in price where it all of a sudden by the time you, it's gonna be much more expensive than this. Do you know what happens with most people, Sam? When they get to about 60 or 55, they kill this product because it's not enough or cost too much money. And now you're only left with the 25,000 if you die. And that's barely enough to pay for your funeral because funeral costs will probably be over 25,000 by the time 35 years have passed. And I go, oh my gosh, well, that's not what I understood. Hey, no problem. You did it right. Maybe you didn't quite qualify for the full 100,000. Let's get that taken care of for you now. So then Sam says, yeah, I need to protect my family. So now I buy a policy for 75,000 whole life. I convert that term into a whole life policy. So now I'm giving you guys a lot more of the art of what we do in terms of somebody who's new hired that's looking to provide coverage at 100,000, only sold 25,000 a whole life because the cost was too expensive for the individual, 75,000 in a 10 year RNC. Someone like me comes along a year later and converts that and makes all that additional money because I sold a whole life product. 
Gabriella, does that answer your question? Yes, that does answer my question. Thank Good. you. So a little bit long-winded. I apologize for that. Uh, I know it was somebody else. Where did she go? Where did she go? Oh, I put my hand down. It's off topic. But I hope that tonight you put like this little piece on the video. Oh, it will be on the video. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm going to do more and more videos like this that aren't the science. It's more about the art. Because I really believe that people don't understand the art. They, they follow the science. When I talk about people, I'm talking about people who move up. Right. As they move up, they know how to do the mechanism very, very well. So they can go to A, B, C, and D, and they can teach that to people and do all that. And now I'm sitting here and I'm like, okay, well, I want senior leaders to be able to teach their people how to maximize their efforts. Maximize your efforts, right? That's what I like to do. So I want to make sure I do it. Yes, uh, I'm sorry. Before I get to you, Stephen, I know it was somebody else. Alex, wasn't it you? Yeah, I did briefly. Uh, I just wanted to verify when it, when you say convert, so like if you're going to convert the 10 RC, um, does that mean that we just get rid of it and we create a new application for that the rest of that 75,000? Or does, uh, is there something it's else? It's a little, do? so the short answer is yes. And I don't want to get us down a rat trap because you learn how to do conversions once you get released and you have an okay. opportunity that comes up. But the simple, or the simple answer is yes. A little more complex is what happens is in my example, when I sit down with <clears throat> someone and I, I want to convert that $75,000 over, I then price it and I have to figure out what the pricing is going to be for that 75K because now they're older, right? When they bought the 10-year uh, renewable convertible, they were 35 and now I'm selling it to them, they may be at 40, 45. So the price has gone up for the whole life product. Following me? So yeah. then I say you're paying, let's say $80 now for that, and it's going to cost you $220 if you were to buy it today in whole. So now I can subtract, not subtract, I'd say instead of paying $80, you got to pay $140 more for a total of $220. Okay. Now the reason I'm telling you all that is because when you convert a 10-year RNC, whoever originally sold it still keeps the commission credit on what they sold. You're just adding on top of that, right? So we talked about agent numbers and hierarchies. You never lose uh, <clears throat> the renewals. <clears throat> if a RNC is converted to a whole life policy, you will just get the credit for the renewal for the amount of the 10-year uh, RNC that you originally sold. Okay. So a little bit longer answer, but that's how that works. Okay. Steve, brilliant. Okay, lots of, lots of questions. Um, well, sir, first of all, does everybody know that when you sell a paycheck protection plan, right, that if I make $50,000 a year and you sell a $50,000 um, paycheck protection, that that annual, that monthly payment after I'm dead is not taxable. So that 50000 is really more than a year's worth of my take-home salary. D does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, because no insurance payouts are taxed, either at right. the federal or at the state level. Right. But I don't know that everybody knows that. Second question for you, Sam, when you convert, you know, let's say I convert in year nine of mm -hmm. my, my renewable convertible term, all I'm really doing is transfer is changing it from a term policy to a whole life policy at my current age for that face amount or if I want less. All you're really doing is preserving my insurability. Yes. Okay. Um, and well, for everybody to understand what he means by that <clears throat> is that when I buy a 10-year RNC, let's say I buy it now, I'm 40 years old, let's just say, in year nine, no, say in year eight, <clears throat> I get cancer. If I were to try to buy a whole life product, I would not qualify, right? We all know that. I would be a decline. However, because I have a 10-year RNC on our product, we do not require, when we convert that to a whole life product, we do not require any medical information. So when you do a conversion, you don't even go through EAP. You go through a different application altogether, <clears throat> and you don't include any, <clears throat> pardon me, any medical information whatsoever. So to Stephen's point, that's insurability. So if I'm smart and I have people I care about and I don't want to spend too much money, <clears throat> I would sell them a certain amount of uh, whole life because I want to get paid. 
And then I'm going to put a 10 year RMC on top. And then as long as that cost doesn't go higher than this, we'll keep renewing it. The moment it goes higher, then I won't renew it. And the reason I'm doing that is I'm protecting that individual's ability to get coverage that otherwise they may not be able to get due to their uh, health or their habits. Right. And last, last point, I, again, I don't know that everybody knows this and it's important because you might get asked. You, you sell, you present it as a paycheck protection plan or a mortgage payoff plan or whatever you want to call it, okay? And, and the sales idea is it maintains your income so your family has that same quality of life while they adjust the fact that mom or dad's not here anymore. That's, that's the reason why we create that picture of need. That beneficiary can still say, I don't want that $100,000 in an income stream for 12 months. Cut me the $100,000 check and give it to me up front right now have a great day you do know that that can be done that's it's not a requirement that they take periodic payments yeah the majority of people do not take periodic payments the reason that it's called income uh, protection is the sale is usually done to the person that we're providing the coverage on right oh, and so totally, in their totally mind understand. yeah in their mind they're thinking okay i want them to keep the house or i want them to keep you know, the income stream coming in. But if it's me and my spouse dies, that value of that money is higher to me all at once than it would be if I strung it out. That's why most people take that money. So yeah, you're dead on, Steve. Yes, Angelica, what can I do for you? Um, I just wanted you to help me understand. One time I sold a union that turned out to be a POS and I did not know. So the end result of that was that it got it was re rewritten during quality and verification somewhere. And I only got credit for the A71 portion. Now it was supposed to be a 2400 ALP. Yeah. So obviously I had a chargeback, right? Yes. So how do we handle that professionally? And then how do we avoid that? Yeah. So that's, uh, you know, what, what she's referring to is that she wasn't in the veteran market, although the same thing could happen to us. My guess is, is that she got a lead for a union. She called it up. She got the appointment. She then sold it. And it turns out that that union member already had a policy with us or had a policy that they had either killed, defaulted, or stopped payment on uh, within a year or six months. So when she wrote the policy, everything looked good. But when it got to the back office, we have a replacement Thing that says if you replace a policy within a certain period of time you don't get any credit on that that's what happened to her so initially she got her advance everything was good then the back office and it takes time it's not something's done in a week it's usually like three to four months they go back and they go hey sam sweet had a policy with us that he stopped four months ago angelica wrote a policy ergo we consider that a replacement she doesn't get any credit for that it is a very frustrating thing, but it's been put in place to protect agents and protect the company from uh, nefarious agents killing policies and then rewriting them and then getting credit for the sale all over again. So it won't happen very often. It can. The best way to protect yourself is when you get a lead and you know you're about to write a policy, what I do is I go into the policy search, I look up that person's phone number, and see if they exist in the system. So I always ask, hey, has anyone talked to you before? Just like it says in the script. And then I ask again, hey, have you ever had a policy, an insurance policy with American income or anything like that? Oh, I think I did way back in the day. Okay, what are the various phone numbers that you've had so I can look that up to see if you exist in the system? Because if somebody exists in the system and they had a policy or, and you're not adding to it, you're actually going to replace it, I won't write that policy at all. Why? Because I'm not going to get paid on it just to have what happened to Angelica and then get it, you know, taken back. I'm not going to waste my time doing that. I'm going to give them the phone number and say, hey, who's you need to call because really in effect what you want to do is renew the policy that you currently have. That's if the policy is less than a year old, okay? Or canceled with, or suspended within a year. So it's just a good practice to have. We typically don't teach that in these classes because most of you are getting brand new leads for people who have never had a policy with us. But as you get better and better at this and you get more and more referrals, you may end up talking to somebody who's not a veteran, but a referral from a veteran. And that person may in fact have a policy with us. 
and may have just killed or had that policy suspended less than a year ago, you do not want to write a policy on them where the same thing will happen to you that happened to Angelica. So any other only, questions about that? Yeah. This only affects if they have a policy with American income life, not like a globe life. Like, should we pay attention to globe life also? Well, you don't have any insight into globe life policies whatsoever. So okay. the policy is American income. So when we're asking them and they say they don't know what policy, we should kind of throw out some names. The best that them. you can do is look up uh, their phone number because, and, and you could try to look it up by their name or by uh, the policy number. If they know they have a policy number and they give it to you, you can look it up that way. Uh, but it, it's very rare that that happens, just so everybody knows. It's very rare. But when yeah. it happens, you're going to remember it because your money will then get clawed yeah, back. Yeah, you feel it in the pocket. <laughs> yeah, it's very rare. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, so we talked about 10-year uh, renewable and convertible. Guess what? It expires at age 65. So you're not selling a 10-year RNC into our market very often because of this reason, right? Our market typically is going to be older. So if you sell a 10-year RNC to somebody who's 60 and you're like, hey, I got you senior person, et cetera, et cetera, it's only good for five years. That doesn't really help them a lot. ADB. What's an ADB policy? What's ADB stand for? Uh, Sean Festival. What? Is it me? Can I not? Can anybody hear? No. None of us can hear you, Sean. How about now? There you go. Yes, now we can. All right. Perfect. It's accidental death. Is accidental. that what it stands for? Accidental death? Accidental death dismemberment. ADB is accidental not death. accidental death and dismemberment. Or accidental death benefit. <laughs> right. Are you sure that's what it stands for? ADB, oh. accidental death benefit. Yeah. Right there. Accidental death benefit. There we okay. go. I was pulling my glass ring up too. <laughs> okay. So we issue it between the ages of five to 64 and it's for an accident only. There is another product called the accidental death and dismemberment product. Which one has more value? Anybody? Accidental death and dismemberment. Why? Uh, because it also include for their arms or something then they also get a payout for that <laughs> for their arms <laughs> yes yeah. so the actual death and dismemberment has, is is both a living benefit and a death benefit right if you survive an accident and you lose a limb or you lose sight of one eye then we will pay you 50 percent of the face value of that product to you if you die then we pay it to your beneficiary so in fact it has more value but what are the odds of dying in an accident, does anybody know? Less than 1%. The older you get, the lower it actually goes. So when I sell somebody who's POS and they have a lot of accidental death benefit insurance, I'm like, hey, the odds that's ever gonna pay out to your family is less than 1%. And the older you get, the odds get even lower. And the reason for that is the longer that we live, the air we breathe, the water we drink or ingest, the liquids we ingest and the food we eat, they all have impurities in them that help break down our body. Our own DNA breaks down. And the more we're exposed to viruses, diseases, infections, and all the rest of that. Any of those kill you, that's a natural death. The ADB will never pay out. Make sense? Okay. So the waiver of premium proven in all states, ages 15 to 55. Boom, 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 boom. Tells you that. Senior graded life, max amount 35,000, 60 to 80. It's a great benefit for the first three years, right? Then you have a special ADB. We typically do not sell this one at all because it's standard benefits. You have a children's writer. Uh, and I know I talk about this with various classes and you do have the ability to add a children's writer into HB Pro. Yeah, you just click on it if they have children. And this is what the writer gets. $10,000, ages 14 days to 18 years of age. It covers until they're 21. It's convertible to 50,000 at age 21. It means you got to pay for it. And if the base insured dies, the policy gets paid up until age 21. So if I bought it right now and my child was five, I'd die next year, whatever amount it was to that point is what will be paid out if the, uh, well, if the uh, child dies before the age of 21. Do I recommend this product whenever you're selling to families with children? 
No. I do not recommend this product. It's a fallback position. <clears throat> It'd be nice to give it to them if they don't have anything else. I would much rather have somebody actually buy an insurance policy for that child. It's a minimal amount. And you can add on to that what's called a GIO or a guaranteed insurability option. But the whole point is, if the child gets over 21 or I die, then there's no value here because it's tied to me, right? It's a writer on my whole life policy. I'd much rather convince a family that, hey, if you're going to buy insurance for your child, buy a policy on them. So whatever amount you buy on them, let's say it's 25000 you're going to spend six bucks a month if that, okay? So you keep that in play when they turn 21, 22, 25, 30, whatever, you transfer ownership of that policy to them. And now they're paying for a life insurance policy, let's say $25,000 at the rate when they were two years old, whenever it was first bought. So there's a lot of families do that to set their kids up financially because a lot of kids, well, they won't buy insurance for themselves. But if you've bought a, share, a policy for your kids and you've kept that going and now you're transferring it over, usually the transfer happens when what? When a kid is done with college, they're working full time, or they're beginning to start a family. You transfer that thing over and go, hey, for $72 a year, you at least got $25,000. Now your spouse doesn't have to pay for your funeral if you die. And the kids typically keep it going. Now, if you append upon that, a writer called a GIO, the Guaranteed Insurability option, what that means is that the child now has the guaranteed ability to purchase an additional $25,000 every three years, starting at age 25 until they're 40. So 25, 28, 31, 34, 37, and then 40. So that's a big amount of money, right? But everybody has the ability to buy insurance. Why is that so important? Because when you have a GIO attached, you are not required to get any medical information from them. So maybe they wouldn't qualify for coverage. Maybe they got some sort of medical condition that prevents them. They can still buy the coverage because it's guaranteed. So work with your uplines on that. Whenever you sell the families with children, <clears throat> in my opinion, always sell a policy specific for the kids and always make sure you add a guaranteed insurability option. In the beginning, in, to my, in my mind, it's actually worth it to reduce the amount of whole life coverage to somebody if the cost needs to remain the same and take the money that was saved by doing that and put it into the children's policy. Your family or the families you sold to will appreciate that a huge amount, particularly if everyone's alive and living and then they transfer ownership to that child. That child can save a heck of a lot of money because they're paying at the rates when the policy was first created. Yes, Jason. And I think you mentioned, because we haven't seen it, that the Head Start applications are not in, in EAP. Where, where do those live? You're talking about this one right here, the Head Start that's improved in all states? Right. I, th I thought that's what you were describing was a, a whole life with the GIO on, on the kids. Well, we call it Head Start. That's just the right. nomenclature for it. But you would still use the same EAP to, to do that. I'm not aware of a separate application that Got it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So the whole life is coverage of a child. You issue from zero to 17, add the guaranteed insurability option, and then you just fill out the child coverage questionnaire. And on the application, it either has to be a parent or it has to be the grandparent. That's the relationship. It can't be the uncle that's buying it. Okay. It has to be the parent or the grandparent. Now, that being said, who pays for it? is a totally different story, but the owner of the policy has to be a parent or a grandparent. Yes, right. Stephen, bring it. The, the only, the yeah, am I correct that, let's say you, you do a head start at 17, and even though it's minimal, right, at say 20, 25, the person wants to add another 25,000. That's at the, their attained age. In other words, if I add it at, if I had 25,000 at 25 years old, I pay 25-year-old rates on that 25000 yes. not yes. the rate when I was 17 and bought the policy. Yes. All right. Yes. Just wanted to make sure my brain was working. Thank yeah, it you. would be really nice huh, if you were paying it at two years old or whatever. I'd, I mean, like to be able, I'd like to be able to reinstate my $50,000 whole life policy that I dropped when I was 21 because I sold it for the cash. I, I took the cash value. That's what I'd like. There you go. Yes, Sean, bring it. 
I was just wondering for that uh, guaranteed insur insurability option. Every three years, they can uh, add more, right? So, if they add that twenty five thousand at age twenty five, at twenty eight, can they add another twenty five thousand to make yeah. it fifty thousand, or is twenty five thousand every three years? Okay, so the, that's so what I thought. You get is what is it one hundred fifty? So twenty five. Yeah. It's one hundred and fifty thousand, right? Yeah. But you're paying for that. You're guaranteed right. to get it, regardless of now. Keep in mind, you still have to give all the information because the right. rates get dependent. But you're you're not going to be denied or declined due to your medical situation, right? And if you and if you skip an opportunity, they're not cumulative. If you if you blow your chance at twenty five thousand at age twenty five, you know at twenty eight you can't add fifty. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, I saw your note, Angelica. You do want me to skip you for right now, right? No, that was for earlier. But um, okay. my question was on guaranteed insurability option. You definitely have to set that at 25K for it to be 25K every three years, right? If you yeah, set when it you just click yeah. on it, it'll ask you how much. I think there's only two options. Uh, I always pick the 25K. Yeah, and it may have changed because it's been a while since I did a GIO. Yeah. But again, for all of us that are selling it to families that have children, mm -hmm. rather than a child writer, I would highly recommend you just sell them a policy with a GIO writer because the cost is negligible. It's really that not that expensive. Yes, Ricardo, bring it. Yes, um, on the planet, um, uh, Arctic website, there's a new videos of uh, training videos with Danny. There is one particular for the head start and explain it like from top to bottom, what you have to do uh, and, and how to um, um, add the 25,000 every three years. And if they uh, get married, they can also add some more uh, to that. So it's very good for you guys to go ahead and, and watch it. It's not a long video, it's maybe five, six minutes, but she explained it like from top to bottom, very easy. Once you see mm -hmm. it, you get it right away. Yeah, I'm going to show the entire training thing to for that Danny puts out all the small little vignettes. Uh, it's on different topics uh, for everybody. So thank you, Ricardo. Yeah, I'm definitely going to go through that. Uh, term to 65, we typically don't sell that anymore. It's there, uh, but we don't usually see that term to 65 or term to 100. Based on the way that I'm telling you to sell, you would never sell this product. Okay. Uh, gosh, you got the 15 to 30 year decreasing term. And the reason I bring this up is that if you ever sell in the POS market, you may see these and it's mortgage protection. And the whole concept here is that you're <clears throat> selling a certain amount of term and it's decreasing. So by the time your mortgage is gone to zero, you no longer need the protection. The whole point here is to protect the mortgage. So if you die, your mortgage would be paid off. Okay. Then you got the child education, the 20 year level term. Again, we don't see this too often. It's not what we typically sell uh, in this market, but we do sell this one, the A71. It's improved in all states and there's all the information about it right here. The number changes depending upon what state you're selling in because there's different variations with different amounts. I've actually seen one state have it up to $600. The A74 is uh, a different type of accident policy. You, it's sold in the US, but not in Canada. And it has set amounts that doesn't go up. Then you have the critical illness policy. Again, you're gonna get with your uplines if you feel it needs to be sold for any one of these. Uh, critical illness, 18 and 64, it's different than cancer, okay? And it's paid upon the first diagnose, diagnosis of a critical illness only, and there's only three amounts that get paid out, 10, 25, or 50, that's it. You do have the lump sum cancer plan that isn't available in California, Virginia, or in the province of Man Manitoba. And again, this is uh, three benefit amounts, and it's only paid after the first diagnosis of cancer only. So if you have the, if you sold this policy to me and I get cancer, I'm only going to get paid one time. If the cancer goes away or goes in remission and then I get diagnosed again, it will not pay out again. And I can't buy another cancer policy, right, if I have one already in existence. Senior qualifying sheet. 
Yeah, let's go through this, right? If somebody who's a senior is T12 or over, it's going to be a trial. The max age is 80, unless you're in Missouri or Nebraska, then it's 75. Health questions on a senior will be a decline. So if they answer yes on any of those questions, that's an auto decline. Any medications on the trial sheet will be a decline. I'm going to show you that in a second. These are sheets you need to have with you anytime you're selling to a senior. So if it's certain type of medication that they say they're taking, automatic decline. Prescriptions, these are trials. If they're taking anything from, I don't have to list all these, but you can see them here, Abilify through to Suboxone or whatever that's called. Any one of these that they're taking, boom, it's a trial. Daily marijuana use. A lot of seniors use marijuana every day to maintain pain or manage pain. If they're taking it, it's gonna be uploaded as a trial. All prescriptions the applicant is uh, prescribed must be listed in the remark section. If they're not taking any, then the applicant, or then you say the applicant isn't prescribed any medications. So you have to ask that, hey, list me all the medications that you're taking. And if I say, hey, I'm not taking any, then you need to write that in the remark section. Yes, Seth. For that marijuana question, if they do it not daily, do you still want to put it as a trial or is it daily only? Daily only. Now, I'm not saying that the back office, based on whatever else they said, moves it to a trial, but you know as a field underwriter that if it's anything other than daily marijuana use, you can submit it normally. Okay. okay. <clears throat> we talked about this, uh, how the rate is broken down, 25, 50, and 75, and then 100% after 36 months. And this is how it shows for 10,000. There's an example, okay? Now, you all aren't going to see this, but when I teach POS classes, this can get a little challenging. When you look at a policy in a POS, it will say for a senior, let's say 12,000 or whatever. I have to look at when the policy was issued to determine the full amount of the policy, right? So if I sold a $40,000 policy and I'm in year two, then the amount that will show in the POS record is how much? Anybody? Year two, a $40,000 policy, how much is it worth if they die? 20000 if they're two years in. That's right. 50%. Okay. Uh, we talked a little about the intercompany replacement program. Okay. So this is what uh, uh, somebody was referring to before. It's a little, it's irritating if it happens to you. But basically... You can't sell anyone in the household if any policies have lapsed within six months. So it'd be the same address. If a member cancels anything in the hospital after six months, then the in, that's an intercompany replacement and you will get a charge back. If you sell someone that has a policy that lasts within the last six months, that's an intercompany replacement. You'll get a charge back. If a member took out a loan within the last six months and is currently using a waiver premium or using the layoff or strike waivers or has a reduced paid up within six months, you can't sell them. You may not know it, so you just do everything that you normally do, and then all of a sudden you'll get a charge back. There's the fees typically associated at the time we put this together for various states. Uh, so you can take a look at this and say, hey, I want to do California as an example. California is almost 200 bucks, right? If I'm in California, I want to do Michigan. Michigan looks really promising because it's only $16.18. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. Let me get Michigan. The problem in Michigan is it's not done electronically. Everything is done by hand. Very, 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 very slow. Pardon me for one second here. Okay. Uh, but Thanks, what I would do personally is I'd ask my upline, hey, where are you licensed in? And then I would look because you can't write business unless they're licensed in that state, okay? So if I'm going to pick California, I want to make sure my upline has California. <clears throat> Pardon me. And then I'm going to figure out <clears throat> how much uh, money am I going to spend to get my license? And if you use NIPR.com and you answer all the rules correctly or all the questions correctly so there's nothing in the business rules that kick out, it's usually done within three to four days. You will get your reciprocal non-resident license. Sam? Yes. Sorry, did you say NIPR or NIRP? NIPR, the National Insurance Producers Registry. 
Okay, thank you. All of you should become a member of that <clears throat> so that you can obtain your um, non-resident licenses. Because I'm assuming everybody here wants to sell in just the state that they're in, correct? Mm -hmm. I think, maybe, no? Yes, yeah. okay. All right, so that's where you can get it. And again, these rate, these costs may change because it's set by the state, not set by us. And again, any money you're paying goes to the state, doesn't go to us. Yes, Ruben. Okay, so you're saying like with Michigan that it is uh, that you have to fill it out like by hand. You can't do the uh, NIPR. I'm sorry. Are you asking me if you can do it by hand? No, you said that with Michigan, you have to do everything long can or just write it out oh, no 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 you can do it through nipr what i said is that michigan doesn't have the business rules in place so for example when i did iowa i put into nipr my information and iowa came back in four days uh oh, gotcha. i think missouri came back in one day and when i say come back is if you meet the requirements based on the business rules that they've set the system will automatically issue you your license but in yeah. michigan they don't do that. In Michigan, when you submit your NIPR application, it goes through their process manually. Oh, they I don't have you. business rules set up to automatically uh, issue you your license. Right. I got you. Okay. I understand. Plus, if you go to Oklahoma, I mean, you're paying a lot of money. North Carolina, a lot of money. <clears throat> Obviously, in New York, we don't do business there. But Nevada, $200, right? Why, why does it cost them $200 in Nevada and California? It, it doesn't really cost that much to get the license. They just want to get their pound of flesh out. Okay, we recognize this, the underwriting flash sheet and the build charts, right? All of that is in HP Pro as well as an e-app. Here's things here, automatic trial list. <clears throat> For all folks, I would have that available anytime you're doing a presentation. So if you had an arrest and you have a misdemeanor within one year, automatic trial. Any type of combination of drug and alcohol history with an arrest, multiple arrests, sexual assault, if you're on probation, boom. Alcohol, if you've had two DUIs and you still drink because the person that answers the question say, yeah, I still drink. And how many DUIs do you have? Oh, I had two. Automatic trial. If you had a DUI three years ago, is it a trial? Sean Festimal. Just one DUI within three years? Yes. Then no. Correct. Drinks between four to six drinks daily. Holy mackerel. Even I don't drink that much. 16 to 35 drinks a week. Do we ever ask somebody if they do 16 to 35 drinks a week? <laughs> we don't. We don't ask that question. Back in joint, we have that question. Are you taking any type of narcotic pain medication daily? And the reason why it's an automatic trial is because we know the abuse of the drug is very prevalent in people that have back or joint pain. So what we need to do is have uh, underwriting, get the information from the medical information board, as well as the other 15 sources that we can get information from to determine if this person's okay to provide coverage. If you had treatment within two years with cancer, an automatic trial. If I had cancer three years ago and it went away, is it a trial? Gabriella? Preciado? If you had cancer before, isn't it auto decline? No. Depends on the type of cancer for the auto decline. Oh, then I'm not sure. So the answer is no. If I had cancer treatment three years ago and I'm good, then I'm all right. But if it spreads to my lymph nodes within 10 years, then I'm going to be an auto decline, not just a trial. Okay. Depression. The depression is the one that gets everybody because. Okay. So the drug companies sell a lot of Xanax and a lot of other drugs. And the doctors prescribe a lot of them. But we know in the insurance industry, if you take those type of drugs, what ends up happening to you? Anybody? Drug abuse? Drug abuse, but probably the most important one is the result of what that drug abuse typically can ruin into, which is a shortened life expectancy. Okay? That's really what it comes down to in the life insurance game. We want to know how long you're going to live. As long as you live long enough, you, we take your money, everything's fine. But if your life expectancy goes down, 
and you have depression, then we're probably going to trial you. So if you look at depression, it says two or more hospitalization missed, currently disabled, you have PTSD, postpartum. I guarantee you that if somebody is not guaranteed, more than likely, if somebody is taking medication for depression, they're taking medication for pain. If that happens, automatic trial, because they're taking two or more medications. Any combination of a depression medication with something else, uh, you should submit it as a trial because what will happen is our QA team will automatically convert it for a trial. So the reason I tell you to submit it as a trial is then you're not expecting to get paid on that. I don't know how many times people I work with go, hey, they're only taking you know X, Y, and Z and I'm going to submit it good. I'm like, you should submit it as a trial. Don't expect to get paid. They're like, no, no, it's all good. I'm like, all right. And then Thursday comes around and QA goes, hey, we sent you an email. This is going to be submitted as a trial. You can't argue that. There's nothing you can do with that. Once the back office determines they're going to change the status to trial, that's done. And you're not getting paid until it passes trial. So my advice and best practice is if somebody is using any type of or, or taking any type of depression medication with anything else at all, automatically submit it as a trial. That way you're not expecting to get paid on that right away. Yes, Jerry. Sam, I may be a little late for this, but back to the um, the back pain and back surgeries and stuff like that. If I had, because I had a back surgery back in 2016, I do not take any medication for it anymore. Um, if it was in 2016, would that still send me a trial or, or not really? No. You're not taking the medication anymore? No. Just physical. No. So what would happen is you would answer yes to the question about back or joint problem, and then we'd fill out the questionnaire. And you're like, hey, I wrenched my back or I had back surgery, but I'm good now. It probably wouldn't be a trial, but it would trigger underwriting to make sure they got your records, right? To see if you were prescribed and if you've ever renewed that prescription. Got it. Thank you. Hey, Sean, in your experience, is everything I'm telling you about depression aligned with what you know? Yep. All right. For new hires, it's always the one that gets us. Always. Whenever we're like, I think I can get by. I think I'm good. And all of a sudden, boom, we went to a trial. Like, what happened? Everyone now knows depression, you got to watch out for. Diabetes, blood sugar, insulin. If you're taking insulin for diabetes, automatic trial. If you're taking metformin, you're good to go. If your blood sugar, if your reading is 12 or 160, depending upon 12 in Canada, 160 in the U.S., automatic trial. If you're taking two or more medications to manage that diabetes, automatic trial. And all the rest of it. If you use marijuana three, four times a week or more, it's an automatic trial. So if somebody says they use marijuana and we notate that in marijuana, we need to bring up the drug use, correct? The questionnaire. And when we bring up the drug use questionnaire, the first thing it asks is, hey, are you using any street drugs? Are you shooting up intravenously? And we say, no, no, no. Okay. How often do you use marijuana? If they say three or four times a week or more, it's an automatic trial. And Jerry Sandoval, why do you think it's an automatic trial? If they use uh, marijuana three or four, four times or more? Yes. Because it's still considered a drug, and so you're using a drug a little too much, maybe? Even if it's legal in the state of Colorado, we still do that? Yeah, 100%. Yep. Because it's like the, the crypto medication is still legal, but same thing. No, the actuary tables tell us no lie. <laughs> so if you're a habitual drug user of any type of drug, prescribed or otherwise, there's going to be issues there. We need to do more due diligence, which is why you submit it as a trial. Ricardo Navarre, bring it. Okay, uh, with uh, diabetes, um, if it's a senior, uh, with the diabetes taking uh, metformin and insulin. Is that automatically trial or? Yes. Well, just the yeah. insulin itself would be an automatic yes. trial. Yeah. Anytime you're taking it's insulin, that's a pretty serious drug, that's an automatic trial. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Awesome. So we talked about drug use, marijuana, 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 any abused drug within the fast five years. 
So if I'm talking to somebody and they were saying, hey, in my 20s, you know, I used meth. I got into that, but I got cleaned up. Uh, I went through the program. I'm good now. And you're 40 years old. Am I going to submit that as a trial? No. No. Right. But if you're 35 and you say, I just got a drug you had three years ago, I'm going to submit as a trial. Doesn't mean they won't get coverage. It means that more due diligence needs to be done. Okay. Heart circulatory, heart attack under the age of 40, automatic trial. If you've had a heart attack and you still smoke cigarettes, and when I was younger, I used to know people like that. I don't know them anymore because they died, right? So if you continue to smoke and you had a heart attack, the odds of your death jumps up really high, and the actuary tables tell us that we need to do more due diligence on you to see if you have any other health issues. Yes, Logan, bring it. Um, sorry, just a little bit late, but it was on like the drug use and stuff like that. So it has like... It talks about marijuana in three different instances where, you know, it talks about daily three to four times. And then the very bottom says marijuana and any drug use. So like, I don't know, to me, that just seems kind of like conflicting with each other. So like with that last one, it just seems like if they use it, you know, even like once a month, that that would be something you'd send to trial. No. And, and maybe I'm not answering your question, but when you get the questionnaire, it asks you four different categories of marijuana use. Do you use it daily? Do you use it three to four times a day, one or two times uh, a week, or occasionally? I mean, that's not the correct word. I forget what it is, but it's a very minimal amount of time. So there's four of those. If you pick the top two, it automatically should be a trial. So that's the first part. The second part is if you use marijuana, no matter how often you use it, and you answered yes to using any other type of street drug, then you're going to be an automatic trial. Okay, I think if now I think I understand it better. And you're smoking marijuana for the pain use, it should be an automatic trial because we know the uh, actuary tables tell us that when people do that, they tend to abuse other things or they have other medical issues. And anything like that is going to cause us as an insurance company to e either rate you because you're a much higher risk or not cover you at all because your risk is too high. Okay. Yeah, so I think I, I, I guess just something. No, I think I just kind of like misinterpreted like the, the last okay. one, um, yeah. but I, th I understand now. Okay. Uh, if you're on blood thinners or if you had a heart attack in the last two years, yeah, you're going to be um, trialed. And if you're disabled due to the heart attack, you're going to be trialed too. High blood pressure. Uh, we don't take high blood pressure readings, right? I'm not going to ask somebody, well, what's your heart blood pressure reading? I want to know, is it normal or abnormal? So if somebody's taking medication, for high blood pressure, and I ask them, is your blood pressure reading uh, normal, sorry, normal or abnormal? And they go, well, it's too high. I'm going to make that a trial because the risk is high, right? If you've been hospitalized the last uh, year or had to go to the ER because of a high blood pressure episode, yeah, you've got to be trial because you're at risk for heart attack, right? If your height and weight ratio is a T5 and above and you have high blood pressure, you're going to be a trial. And if you all forget to do that, if the weight is in a T5 and they're taking high blood pressure medication, or whatever, and you're like, hey, you're good to go. Your QA people will catch that and you'll get a nice little email that says, hey, we changed the status of this to trial. You should know this is a field underwriter that you're responsible for making sure you submit uh, applications as trials when they qualify as a trial. Okay. Uh, if the high blood pressure is under control, or you're taking two or more high blood pressure medications, or you've had a high blood pressure diagnosis within a year or recently, okay? Then we're gonna trial it. If you were born premature, if you have jaundice as an infant, boom. If you've had a kidney transplant or a kidney infection within one year, if your high weight combination is a T10 or above, trial. Yes, Ruben. Um, with a kidney infection, would that include like dialysis if they're on dialysis? No, dialysis is different. Dialysis, uh, we asked that question, right? Are you taking dialysis? If you're doing that as a senior, you will be declined, so we won't submit you. As a person under the age of 60, we then have to fill out, I think, that questionnaire, and the answers to that questionnaire will tell us. Okay. I'm pretty sure if you're on dialysis, you will not be qualified. You will decline. Yeah, I'm pretty sure if you're, because the idea there is that the, and I know this to be true, the life expectancy for people who are getting dialysis is very low. When I say very low, it's less than what there would be if they weren't on dialysis. 
And, and unfortunately, the, I mean, I know this personally, right? The fact of the matter is, if you're on dialysis, you're waiting for a kidney transplant. The life expectancy for a kidney transplant is no more than seven years. So you can kind of see if you're on dialysis why you wouldn't qualify to get coverage, okay? Uh, if you've ever been declined by us before, yeah, you're not gonna get coverage from us again. We gotta submit it as a trial. Doesn't mean you're gonna automatically be declined, but it means that we need to look at it again. And any question mark yes in section A of the senior application should be automatic trial. More often than not, you're going to be declined because you're going to be too old. So let's see this here. 30-year-old uh, male, very healthy, no meds, but it's taking nitroglycerin as needed. Heart attack at age 28 without any residual effects. He does, does he qualify? Okay, so based on what I just said, what is the class thing? Uh, if I'm a 30-year-old male, pretty healthy, I had a heart attack two years ago, and I'm taking nitroglycerin as needed. Am I an auto decline? Am I a trial or can I submit as normal? I think it's definitely at least a trial. I just wasn't sure. I'm with you. So who knows the answer definitively? Because you all should have this open, right? I mean, I'm showing it to you, but you all have it up, right? On your computer screens or printed out. What are we going to say about a heart attack within two years? Or under the age of 40. There you <clears> go. So if he was over the age of 40, then you're going to look within two years. Since the age is 30, doesn't matter if he's taking nitroglycerin or not, he will automatically be submitted as a trial, okay? But not declined, is what you're saying? No, not auto these are trials. Trials okay. only. Okay, so, all right, cool, thank you. Yep, absolutely. Uh, respiratory, if you have emphysema, ER treatment in the last six months for asthma, hospitalized overnight within the last year, hospitalized for pneumonia within six months, or a child diagnosed with asthma under the age of nine. If you've had a grand mal seizure within two years, if you've had a stroke and you still smoke, yeah, your risk is really high. If you've had a stroke in the last two years, uh, your risk is high, but the reason it's only two years is we know if you had a stroke and you go beyond the two years, you're probably gonna be okay. That's what the stats tell us. Then if you have sleep apnea, and sleep apnea, unfortunately, is usually seen or, or seen prevalently in people who are, uh, their height and weight combination is a T6 or above, and in conjunction with diabetes, then you're gonna be uh, trialed. And if you're not following the recommended treatment, so I don't know if I did this, but when you uh, fill out an application for somebody, if they have sleep apnea issues, because that's a question that's asked for the medical questions, you will get the sleep apnea form. And on that form, it's gonna ask, were you recommended to take medication or to use a CPAP or have surgery? If the answer is yes, we're gonna say, what recommend, what, recommendation were you given and are you following it? And if you say, well, I was given a CPAP that I'm not following it because I can't stand sleeping at night, it should be an automatic trial. Does anybody know what sleep apnea is? Although let's just ask one person. Omar, do you know what sleep I apnea is? I know what is? it is. Well, uh, what, you can't fall asleep at night? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, you can actually fall asleep. It's when you stop, you stop breathing for a little bit when you sleep. Exactly. You don't get a restful night's sleep because you're constantly stopped breathing. And if you listen to somebody has sleep apnea, it literally sounds like they're dying because they stop breathing. So we know that if you aren't following the recommendations for either the surgery or the CPAP, uh, the odds of you dying in your sleep because you stop breathing goes up. Yes, Jerry. So <clears throat> just to add to the sleep apnea whole thing, I actually had sleep apnea at some point in my life when I was 377 pounds and it was awful. I mean, you sleep, you stop breathing, you wake up in the middle of the night, you're like choking, uh, you cannot breathe. And then you wake up in the morning with headaches and you know, you just feel tired all day long. But then there's ways to battle. Like I, I ended up losing 140 pounds and took the test again. No more sleep apnea, and now I can sleep like a baby. I wake up in the morning, I feel great, but I sleep apnea absolutely sucks. You're lucky. I can't get rid of mine. <laughs> wow. Anyway, so congratulations, Jerry and Kim. We feel for you. Yeah, uh, glad to Kim. Uh, yeah, it's not only for, for when you're overweight. There's also people who's just got it because of their trachea. Yep. Now, these are auto trial diseases and disorders. 
So if somebody has any of these, it's an automatic trial. So if somebody says, oh yeah, I have uh, sarcoidosis. You're like, I have no idea what sarcoidosis is. Do you really want to ask them what it is? I mean, you could, but I'd much prefer you go, okay, and just take and note that and then look it up here and go, oh, okay. Is that spelled S-A-R-C-O? They're like, oh yeah, that's the one. You're like, okay, well, so let me tell you what will happen because you have that. It's our policy that we can still submit you. You probably are still going to get the coverage that we've talked about, but I have to submit it as a trial. What that means is I'm not going to collect the money from you until the trial is complete. Well, what is a trial, Sam? Well, a trial is where underwriting takes more time to do due diligence on anybody that has, and I hope I pronounced it right, sarcoidosis. Okay. So anytime somebody tells you they have any of these or any type of disease or issue, you look on this list to see if in fact it's here. If it's not here, it doesn't have to be an automatic trial. But if they have lymphoma, manic depression, hemophilia, uh, scleroderma, I don't know what that is, hot syndrome, chronic bronchitis, chronic kidney infections, any of these that show up, you just need to submit it as a trial, okay? The big one that all of us need to know about is this. If they tell you I'm on a medication and it's not one that you hear, so like metformin, okay, you're good to go. But if they tell you, you know what, uh, I'm taking morphine, I tell you, anybody taking morphine, automatic trial, right? They've got serious pain issues going on. But anything that shows up here, you don't have to know <clears throat> exactly what it's for. You'll probably discover that in the medical questions. But if they tell you you're taking this, it's an automatic trial. If a senior tells you they're taking one of these medications, it's a trial. Okay. Because in the senior program, we just want to know what medications are you on simply to know if you need to be trialed. Because if you don't need to be trialed, then we're going to send it through, right? Otherwise, you're on a decline. Yes, Logan, what's your question? So, like, obviously, this is a lot of information, you know, sending people to trial and stuff. Like, what would you recommend to, like, kind of ingrain this stuff in your brain so you can learn it or do you like when you know you're doing the e-app do you just keep that up on a separate screen so if you need to check up on a separate it. screen it's probably five percent of the time maybe a little bit more that this comes up so i just have a printout right over here and when i get through hp pro when i ask for those four questions in hp pro right to see if they even qualify i ask what medication are you taking And if they give me a medication that's on this list, then I'm going to know it's going to be a trial. If it's not on this list, I know it's not going to be a trial. Then I want to know what they're taking the medication for to make sure they're not going to be a trial or decline. Okay. So the four questions are designed for you to say, okay, they're not going to qualify, but I use it for determining whether or not they're going to be in a trial. I'd much rather know sooner in my presentation that it's going to be a trial than not. So that way I can set the correct expectations with the client, okay? So I put this thing up and I have it available for me. So if you're a senior and you're taking any of these, trial. So here's some other things to note, right? If it was previously declined, not taken out or incomplete, the new application will be a trial, that's automatic. Children can only get half the amount of coverage that a parent has, that a parent with less coverage has, sorry. So if a parent has $25,000 in coverage, how much can a child get? 12,500. Yeah, so children can only get half the amount of insurance that parent with less coverage has, right? So what it's saying is if I have $50,000 in coverage, but my spouse has $25,000 in coverage, we default to the lower amount, the, the parent with the lower amount, which is 25, and then we only give the child 50% of that. And why do we do that, Jason Radford? Why does that even make a difference to an insurance company? Um... I forget what the technical term is, but basically we don't want somebody to profit from the death of their child. 
puts right. them in jeopardy. Some odd reason when that when we sell policies like that, mm -hmm. the percentage of children that die exceeds the national average. I don't, I don't know why that is. So in order to reduce our risk, we then put it lower. Any child who was adopted or has a legal guardian must have adoption or guardian paperwork with the application or they will be trialed. So if you are adopted, I was adopted by the way. So if you were adopted and your parents want to get coverage on you, your, your uh, adoptive parents, they need to submit the paperwork to us. And if they don't submit it, then it will be trialed. And then what we'll do is we'll go to the state and we'll get the adoption records, okay? No, I'm sorry, not the adoption records, but the record that in my case that I was adopted by these parents with these social security numbers so that then it's legal for them to get coverage on me. Otherwise, I can't put coverage on a child. Any marijuana user quoted NTU rates or submitted without an alcohol and arrest questionnaire will be trialed. So what does that actually say? What is that actually saying? Stephen, you should know. What does this say? Use the use the proper rate when you quote tobacco. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you're if you're a marijuana user, you use tobacco rates. Exactly. So for all of us, oh, I got CBD. I put the ointment on my elbow, or I do the oil in the thing, or I do a bond, or whatever it is that you think you're doing. If you use marijuana, you need to say that they're a tobacco user. Yeah. That. Yep. That's great. Congratulations. You pay more. Have a great day. <laughs> That's just the way it is, okay? If you don't do it, we're going to do it for you, which then is not good because then they'll send you nasty emails and let you know, okay? Uh, any applicant who does not have a social security number is a trial. There are going to be applicants, and I'm in California, I have them all the time, that don't have social security numbers. They can still get coverage. They just need to be trialed because we need to vet that they're eligible for coverage to get the rates in the state of California. Any application with three or more corrections will be trialed. Not to not to throw us down a rabbit hole, but if you, as long as you're eligible to work in the U.S., that qualifies you, correct? Uh, so I'm going to avoid that rabbit Never hole. Mind. Um, All right. Never mind. And I'm going to say, mind. when you fill out EAP, if you uh, don't have a social security number, you will have to fill out additional forms. And the answers to those forms will determine whether or not you will get coverage by underwriting. You will automatically be a trial. Got it. Okay. Now, if you have three or more corrections, it will be trial. So this is th this one will get you every time if you're a new hire. You, when you submit an application, you want it to be correct. You don't want to have a mistake like somebody smokes and you forgot to leave the NTU unmarked, right? Non-tobacco use. The age was wrong. The weight was wrong. Something else was wrong. If you've got three or more errors that had to be corrected, it will be submitted as, as a trial. And Sean, if I do that consistently... What does the company do to me? If Honestly, I'm not sure. I haven't heard that oh, before. They're going to take away my advance okay. or my bonus. When I say take it away, you just get suspended for a period of time. It's a quality control check. We want to make sure people are entering information correctly. So don't be afraid of this, everybody. Once you start doing these applications, they know in the beginning you're going to make some mistakes. No big deal. You can get it fixed when you get a mod. But everything else, you're going to know tight. You're going to do it exactly right. OK, and the reason that quality checks everything for mistakes is because we have a lot of people in the past that were fraudulent. And we're putting in incorrect information to try to get the policy issue. OK, so just do it the way you're supposed to do it. You won't have any problems whatsoever. OK, and wow, that's the end of the list for that. Bank draft dates. We already went through this. Examples of veteran lead materials, controlled business. So let's talk about that for a quick second here before we take a break. Applications are considered controlled business when they're written on yourself. So if I write a policy on myself, can I do that? Absolutely, but it's controlled business, which means what? I won't get paid on it. When the agent is the payer, so if I use my checking account to make payments for uh, people who don't live for me, live with me or not related to me, but I'm making the payments, controlled business, right? We do not advance the agent on controlled business and no production credit is given. However, the bin, the uh, the business will pay commissions as earned. What does that mean? It means you'll you'll get what you have to things. Sorry, go ahead. You're both right. We're going to pay you. We're just not going to advance you. And we're not going to give you production credit. So you know you need to sell $93,000 in a year in order to get the free trip for the annual convention. Okay? 
if you sold two thousand dollars to yourself or to someone else in the example i gave you will get paid the commissions on that as they're earned so every month the payment is made you're going to get paid on that you're not going to get advanced on it but you're not going to get credit for that two thousand dollars as it counts towards your annual amount of alp that's earned does that make sense to everybody okay so you can write business, it's just not gonna be controlled business. Sorry, you can write business, but if it's controlled business, you won't get paid in in advance. Yes, Kimberly. So would you have to um, put that in the comments or something that it's controlled or whatever, or do you just put it through like normal and they'll see that it's controlled? Well, you could put it in the comments if you want. If you write business, they always check. They're going to look at the last name and if the last name is the same they're going to ask you is this person related to you okay right if your checking account number shows up there and they know that because they have your checking account number and the name on there then boom they're going to know that gotcha uh, okay yeah what a lot of people do if they want to write business they just have someone else write the business for them now uh Controlled business is the agent themselves, the mother, stepmother, father, stepbrother, brother, so on and so forth. Okay, all that. What is not considered controlled business is your mother-in-law, your father-in-law, your brother-in-law, all of those, right? Sorry, all of these right here. But if you use your checking account to make the payments, then it's controlled business. You are responsible for marking controlled business, so that's easily distinguished. You are responsible. So to Kim's point, You'd want to put it in the remarks section. This is controlled business. A comment in the notes section that is controlled business and an email to policy information referencing the policy number. And an agent is fine as anyone in the agent pipeline is committed to contracting with the company. So follow Sam, me. Is Grand Child, sorry, is Grandchild on that list? Of for which one? Uh yeah, this list here. Okay, it's not. Okay, no. thank you. Yep, so you can write a policy on your grandchild. But if you're paying for it, it puts it back in the, the bucket. What's that? But if she's paying for her grandchild's coverage, then it's, yeah, it's under your checking account information, you're paying for it, then yeah, you would be controlled business. Mm -hmm. Now, the agent, for the purposes of this, is defined as anybody who is committed to contracting with the company. Doesn't mean you're under contract, it means you're committed. So if you have a recruit that you put into the system and then you try to sell a policy on that recruit, control business. Now, if I'm talking to a uh, policy owner, or I'm talking to a veteran or whatever, and I sell them a policy and I recruit them in, that's not controlled business because at the time that I sold it, they weren't committed to American Income Life, right? So that doesn't apply there. Any questions about controlled business? Awesome, awesome, good stuff. These are examples we talked about. Any questions about the draft dates? So a quick check, Justin, if I sold a policy today, right? And I said that the draft date is gonna be on the 19th, is that good or bad for the client? You asking me? Yes. Uh, I'll be honest with you. The last like 10 minutes, I'm dealing with a client because I'm at work. Oh, okay. So I'm, no I'm kind of lost here now. Yeah, don't worry about it. Deanna Forster, Deanna, if I sold a policy today and the draft date's on the 17th, is that a good or bad thing for the client? Bad. That's right. Because they're going to get hit twice within 30 days. Yep, yeah, Kim. So what do you do if, say, it's today and you're writing a policy and they're like, well, I want it to come out specifically on the 15th, but that's outside of what this is telling us to do. So like if, that, if they're asking us to do it outside of these days, what are we supposed to do? So what I would do is say, listen, if we put it on the 15th, we're gonna draw it again in literally 16 days. And, and actually since today is Thursday, we probably won't do the first draft until Monday, which would be what? The uh, second, third, fourth, fifth, and then 10 days later, we're gonna hit you again. So Kim, what I advise that we do is we set a date outside of the 15th. And once that date passes, call me, and then we can change the next draft date to the date that you want. 
Okay, so we would keep it this way for now and be like, we can change it, but I don't yeah, want to so change, it change afterward. But if you, so if I had said, hey, Kim, you know what? I hear what you're saying. I know you told me you definitely have to have it on the 15th. No problem. We'll, we'll do that for you. Just know it's going to come out twice. And you go, okay, that's fine. You are the exact person that will call customer service and cancel your policy because you got hit twice. I got charged twice. Exactly. So, or, or not just you, but maybe your spouse. They're like, hell no, they're taking out too much money. Pardon my French. They're taking out too much money. I don't want to do it. So I'm telling all of you, best practices, don't get sucked in. Do not give in. Tell them, nope, you can only choose between now and the 14th. If you Could want to say it's the system, then change it after the fact once you call me. But the first time, I want to make sure that we do this correct. Yes. Go ahead, Kim. That's it. That's it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So everyone gets this. We talked about all of this. This stuff here, I would print out and have it ready for you. I would have, I just have it ready because you're not going to refer to it that often. But once you hear a certain medication, you're like, oh, yeah, uh, Daladid, Effiant, Eloquis. We see the commercials for Eloquis all the time. Like, why do? <laughs> if they're taking that, ooh, automatic trial. And then you'll start to memorize it because you'll hear it enough. Oh, those ones are going to be automatic trials. But when you hear one you've never heard before, right? So someone is uh, taking lithium as opposed to taking Xanax, you're going to know, oh, that's a trial. Or if they're telling you, you know what, I've got um, encephalitis. Oh, I've never heard that before. Is that on my list? Let's look. Alphabetical order, encephalitis. Boom. I know it's going to be automatic trial. Now, the reason we do this is because you can then convey to the client and set the correct expectations. Hey, Sean, I'm not going to have the money taken out of your account immediately. We're actually going to submit you as a trial. And what that means is it's going to take about 90 days. We're going to go through it. We're going to do due diligence um, with the medical information that you're giving me, contacting your doctor, making sure everything is great. And then they're going to let me know what the result is. Then and only then are we going to take the money out of your account. But I'll let you know. Okay. And Sean's going to be like, okay, I got it. So now they think they're getting coverage and they're not having to pay for it right away. But as I explained once before, when we submit a trial, Jerry Sandoval, when does coverage take effect? Uh, once it gets approved by the underwriter. Correct. If I submit it and it's not a trial, everything goes through clean, when does coverage take effect? When the first, uh, when the first payment takes place? Actually, it takes effect immediately. Immediately? Okay. So if I take out a policy on myself or if I sold one to Kim and Kim dies tomorrow, uh, but everything is good on the application, then theoretically, we're going to pay that out immediately. However, it starts to get a little tricky because if that happens, what is underwriting going to do? They're going to jump in and they're going to look, did I do everything correct on the application? And if on that application... I had submitted that their take or that, that she has pancreatic, no, uh, multiple sclerosis. Yikes. That should have been a trial. And if it's a trial, then we don't provide coverage. So it's really incumbent upon us to make sure we set the correct expectation. If you submit something and it goes through clean, right? And then your QA comes back and says, hey, we had to change the status of this to a trial. You missed X, Y, and Z. What are you supposed to do? Call when they call. tell you it's now a trial versus a clean application. You call the client. Yep, you call the client. You set the, you set the expectation because we're not taking the money out. And more importantly, if we're not taking the money out, you're not covered. Bingo. And... Sadly, what if the reverse happens? What if there's an application that should have been a trial? Sadly, it doesn't get picked up by QA. The bank draft happens and the person dies the next day. Regard, even if they didn't die from the condition that should have caused the trial, that, that's still a valid claim. Correct? Yeah, we're going to pay that out. All right. We'll pay that out, but then there's going to be a little note that gets sent to the SGA, to the RGA. <laughs> to the MGA, to the GA saying, hey, we need to provide some coaching and training because this should have been a trial. We took on a risk that we shouldn't have taken. And to Jason's point though, QA will catch all of that. That's their job. They sit there every single day. They're looking at all the applications. If anything shows up 
that should have been a trial, they're going to catch it. That QA person or team is paid for by who? Who pays for that? Does AIL pay for that? No. Does AO pay for that? Does your upline pay for it? Who pays for that? Anybody know? Who pays for that QA person? It would make sense. The upline pays for it. The upline pays for it, but it's uh, RGA and above. I think the MGAs may have some in there, but definitively the RGA and certainly the SGA is paying for that. And let's be frank, when I show you how much these guys are getting paid, they can afford to pay for a little bit of QA. It's in their interest, right? <laughs> they want to make sure things are done correctly. Okay. So we have all that. We went through all the different things that can trigger an actual trial all the way up to the top. There we go. We've got the height and weight charts, the underwriting flash sheets. We talked about the NIPR and we talked about intercompany replacement and the types of policies that are available to us. All right, we're going to take a break. It's eight minutes after the hour. Please come back. 25 minutes after the hour, everybody. Thank you very much. All right, so we did a little bit of the Agent Resource Center. We talked about some other stuff. Let's dive into Planet. So everyone, let me show you my desktop. and You can follow along because you all should have your login into Planet as well. So let me share my screen and look like share my screen. Hello, share my screen. There we go. Nice. And now I'm going to bring up Planet. Sam, before we move on, I have a question about how you got to the the form that we were on before. Which was it called? The agent? No, the agent automatic trial list. How did you get there from that page? The automatic trial list is a sheet that's in your new agent packet. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's like page, uh, let's see here. It's page something somewhere. Automatic trial list starting on page 42. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we are, where are we? We're here. We're in the planet, what everyone refers to as planet. Hey, you need to go on planet, figure that out. That's what they're talking about. It's this website here, planet. I'm sorry, planetaltig.com. And every one of us should have a login. In this case, there's mine. And there you go. Once you log in, you come up with this screen. When the screen comes up, there's a lot of information. The first thing is here. This is where we communicate to the field all at once, various bits of information. Right now, um, there was a chairman's contest that we did. We have uh, view the AO recognition page, people who receive recognition based on certain achievements. We have the record breakers, so we know in every category who's the leader, so to speak, in every category. We have AO Vamos, which is specific to the Spanish speaking market. People who sell in that market can be part of AO Vamos. We have uh, every week AO puts out a video and we call it AO TV. You can go here to get the uh, current week's episode. And then every Monday and every Friday, we have the national AO sales call, or I'll say the international AO sales call. It's every uh, Monday and Friday at 11 a.m. On Mondays, it's broken out dependent upon what your role is in the organization. So if you're a GA, you join one call. If you're an SGA or a GA, sorry, if you're a, an agent, you go in one call. If you're an SGA or an S, gosh, I'm doing it wrong. First of all, agent goes to one call. SA and GA go to another call. MGA and RGA go to another call. So it's broken up dependent upon what role you have in the company because the things they talk about are specific to your role. On Fridays, however, that is a sales call and that is called the master's class. And everybody can join that call regardless of what role you have in the company. And it talks about, it brings on people who are proven performers, and it talks about their tricks and things of that nature. Not tricks, but their techniques and things of that nature in order to do this job well. We encourage all new hires, and in some uplines, it's a requirement 
but I encourage all new hires to attend every Monday and every Friday. Now, in addition to that, you have the uh, veteran sales call, which is every Wednesday at 11 a.m. <clears throat> that call is specific to our market. So you may have the same information, same type of information that's provided, but it's very specific to our market. And they may give you highlights about what's going on in our market, how we're doing, how many referrals we're getting per cent, all those types of things, just to give people feedback on what's going on in that market. So national or international sales calls for AL take place Monday and Friday. Monday, it's dependent upon what role you're in. Friday, it's for everybody because it's the master's class. And then on Wednesday, particularly, there is a class at 11 a.m. for the veterans market, okay? Uh, access to live training calls. You can click on here, and what this will do is give you, when we have live training calls, you can click into here. So what that means is people who are definitively experts in that market will actually have live calls that you can observe. So a lot of us have been observing presentations and sales of people in our upline, which is great. We definitely need access to that. But then at a national level, you can go and see the top experts actually talking to folks. And if you want to just watch them, you can watch the Zoom call as well. You know, the ones previous. So this doesn't happen every week or every month. It's every so often we'll put that out there. And you'll get notified well in advance that there is going to be a McGruff Live or a Credit Union Live or a Veterans Live training. It's pretty informative. It's interesting to see how people handle it live, real time, talking to folks and getting those presentations up. And it's really nice because it's not just, I don't know how everyone does in this upline, but it's not just you like looking over somebody's shoulder or seeing this camera from way over here. And no, this is like you see exactly what the client sees and you can see the individual doing it, at least with Andrew for the Veterans Live training. Okay. So that is the uh, veterans live training. And I think without all of these up here, and this will change all the time depending upon what it is. Yeah, the chairman's contest. Okay, over here on the left-hand side, once you get your profile set up, you'll have a picture of yourself. It'll show you how much you've sold for the week. It'll show you how much you've sold for the year based on the information you put into the system. It's not tied to HB Pro or anything like that. It's what you're putting in every single day that you're selling something. And the way that you do that is you click on this little button over here. I know I'm skipping a bunch, but I just want to show you how this is tied. You click on production. When you click on production, it asks you enter daily production, look at your production reports. We're going to click on enter daily production. When that comes up, it shows you 1128 all the way through 124. All right, so Monday through Sunday. And it says appointment starts, point finish, total presentations, total sales, total ALP, total AH and H, all these things up here. And the way that you enter those things is you click on the little symbol here, same like in HP Pro. <clears throat> you click on that and this dialog box comes up and you say, okay, well, I had four that I have scheduled today and I only saw two of them because the other two were no shows. But if you're getting on the spots appointments, you may say, I only had one that was actually scheduled, but I actually gave three presentations. That means you had at least two on the spots. Okay, that's how you put that in there. Then you're putting the total amount of ALP that you sold on that particular sit, 2,500, 1,200, 600, whatever it is, you're putting it in there. And you're putting in the total amount of a uh, accidental health because you get compensated differently based on ALP versus this. And then you put the total number of referrals collected. Hey, I got seven referrals today or sponsorships or plus leads, whatever you want to call them. That's what you would put in here. Now, the reason this exists is because before HP Pro was uh, released, this is what everybody used. Now in HP Pro, it will automatically track that stuff within HP Pro but it doesn't automatically put it over here. So there are plenty of agencies and uplines that still require you to put this information in. On my team, I require them to do this because it's the fastest, it's the easiest way that I can immediately see how their day is going, what they've done. So I don't, I ask them not to wait till the end of the day. I ask them to put it in after every sit. I want it updated. 
Okay, it's just a good tool for you, if not for anybody else, because it tells you kind of what's going on. So let's say I put that in there. Uh, I I did. I got ten referrals out of those three sits. Uh, I had three presentations because that's what I said I finished with. Uh, two of them were sales, and they were in the veteran market. So I would say two in the veteran market, two in the veteran market, because they're either the Pavet or they're the return cards. And down here, uh, this is what I would do. I'd say two dash veteran or vets. That way I know they were in the vet, veteran market because we don't break out the veteran market specifically here yet. Probably will, but we're not there yet. So once I do that, if I click on save, well, it's going to ask me how much did I sell? So let's say I sold $2,000, okay? So I put that in there. So I sold $2,000, had no other type of sales except for the veteran. Everything looks good. I click save. When I click save, now it shows me I had one that was scheduled. I had three appointments. So I had two on the spots. I gave three total presentations and I out of those three, two were sales. So my close rate is 66%, right? I sold $2,000 ALP, no uh, accidental health. I collected 10 referrals. None of them were referrals, referrals, referrals. Nope. Response card right there. And then I put the comments up there. So I've got $2,000. If I go back and click on home, you'll see that my name says now I have booked $2,000 this week. And after the week is over, it goes back down to zero and you start over again. Now, this is not the formal reporting. The formal reporting is done when you submit the e-app, okay? No one looks at this and says, oh, okay, I'm going to pay you off of this. No, 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 no. <laughs> e-app is the holy grail. It has to go into e-app and then it has to go through the process. The reason we have this here is so that all of us can have a quick way of knowing exactly where I'm at at any given time. Does that make sense to everybody? Sean, as a GA, do you have your team fill that out every day or whenever they do a sit? Honestly, no, I wasn't. I didn't really know about that, to be honest, but I'm going to start. Okay, awesome. It's a good practice. It's not required. Uh, however, when I first started AO, it was required. And the reason, here's the key. The reason it was required is because Rick Altig has a team of people at the AO level that run reports based on what you put in here at the end of every day. And then what they do is they reconcile what you said you did with what actually went through this system. And if there's a big gap, they're going to ask questions and they start again with your RGA down to your, uh, or start with your SGA down to your RGA down to your MGA. So in order to make sure everything is copacetic, they required us to fill this in every single day. Even if we didn't have any sales, doesn't matter. They want to know, boom, how many appointments did you have? If you didn't have any, that's great. Did you do any on the spots? Did you get any book for today? So if I start a sale, I'm sorry, if I start with zero appointments today, I get one on the spot and I book three for this evening and they all show up, what should I be putting into the appointment start? Anybody? Sandra says four. Sean, what do you say? Can you repeat it? If I started with one for the day, I booked three for later today and they showed up, all four showed up, how many do I say started? One. One. That's what you had one on schedule. started because that's what you had scheduled from the day before. Now, we kind of consider on the spots or when you're getting appointments for the same day, whether it's, with, whether it's right now or whether it's an hour from now or three hours from now. If it's in the same day, we count it as on the spot. And we do that because we knew when we looked at the report from yesterday, you only had one appointment booked because we can look in your mobile planet and we know, right? So that means you're starting with one. If you end up with four, that means you got three on the spot. Does that make sense? Okay. So we went through all of that. We do that for every single day. And then when Sunday night comes, this all gets zeroed out and you start over again. So if you're a SAG or higher, you can look and see how your team is doing, right? I can click on this. I can see these other people on my team and know what's going on. Does that make sense? So if I want to know how my team is doing, uh, Sean, I can do this and know immediately if I'm having this fill them, if, I, if they're filling this out consistently, I know exactly where they're at, how they're doing. Okay. All Perfect. Right. Thank so, you. Yep. Absolutely. Let's go back to the homepage. So that's why that number is driven or how that number is driven over here. So let's go down the left side first. 
So you have your lead inbox. This is the same thing as your lead inbox on your mobile planet. It just looks a little differently. So you can see all these leads that I have, all these calls that I've made, I have uh, 493 leads, in which a bunch of them are gonna be referrals, right? Because I'm doing mostly training now. So that's what is in the lead inbox. You can resolve a lead, you can uh, book an appointment, put comments, filter by any of those things. You can see what the schedule looks like moving forward, just like in Mobile Planet, it just looks a little differently, okay? Uh, if you're a leader in the organization, uh, I can click up here and I can select the people below me, what they have going on, what's in their lead inbox, and et cetera, et cetera. If I wanted to know what all those read-off letters were, I can click there and I can put in the code. So put in the pavet and there it is. I can click on that and I can see exactly what that letter is going to be by clicking download letter. Okay. And then we know when we go into HP Pro, there's like all these other letters, right? Group letters. If you pick the wrong one and it's not a veteran market letter, you're going to get a different letter from some union head, right? And it won't make any sense to the veteran. Like I don't belong to this union. So I always put in the correct one. But if you work it in the other markets, you can now find out what the other read off letters are. Okay. All right, so that's the lead inbox. Then you've got HP Pro. We should all be familiar with that because when I click on HP Pro, it automatically takes me to HP Pro. In this case, I haven't logged in yet today, so I would log in and then boom, I've got HP Pro working, okay? Uh, recruiting, you can add people in here. You can do things once you become an SA, this becomes important to you. I'm not gonna go into it now because none of you are SAs, let me rephrase that. None of the new hires <laughs> are considered essays. You may be in this class because you're an essay or above, but if that's the case, you already know or should know how this works, okay? Then you come down to reports. There are reports that you can get to in here, but there's better places to get updated reports. And we have a lot of reports that are out. You have the ap &P report, which is agency, agent productivity and persistency report. You've got your advanced report. There's all kinds of reports that you will start to get once you sell something that really are going to be informative to you because they may affect how that report is written. Sorry, the information on that report may affect how much your bonus payout is going to be as an example. Okay. Then you have uh, the production that we talked about. Sorry, then you have policy. So if I click on policy, I can look at my mod inbox. I can see if there's any held business. I can go down and click on bank verification. If I know I'm doing this on the computer, I want to run the bank verification, there it is. We all know this, right? We've seen this together. If you want to go to your mod inbox when you're on here, you can do that as well from the policy section. So I can just click on that and then it will say mod inbox there. You have agency. If I click on agency, if I am a person or above, then you get all of this information here, right? With the agency information. So if I'm an essay or above, the people fall underneath me, uh, I will see right there and then uh, who I work for. So this is really good for somebody who moves into management. You know who your agency is because one of the things you can do is you know who you have as builders, who hasn't gotten hired yet. You can know who's in training. And when I say training, when you go through the state management training and you use our tools to go through it, we can actually track where you are in the training process. We know how far along you've gotten. We know what your score was when you took your internal test, everything. Okay which is really helpful for us when we're calling you every week and saying, how are you doing? We can see how well you're doing. And then code ready. These are the people who have passed. They're ready to be coded. Boom. Let's code them. Let's get them going. And then the people that are coded, we have them right there. Any question? I mean, most of this can be for essays and above, but at least you now know when you get promoted, where you're going to be looking at, because this becomes very important for us. If you have any questions, just stop me as I go through this. Okay. Then you have supplies. Let's look at AO supplies. So this is AO. We can order physically the gift certificate, the PLUS program, the child safe kits, the Click RX. We can see what all that is. We can order all that stuff if we wanted to have physical items, okay? If we wanted stuff from AIL, there's different forms there that we could request uh, stuff. All of this stuff we can get physically have it sent to us. 
if we felt we needed it. Okay. Then you have key areas. Uh, I'm not going to go through this because it's exactly the same thing that you can find on planet itself. Recruiting, training, sales, quality, and resources. So I'm going to go through those when we get back to Planet. You have AO Rewards Program. So when you click on that, remember I said you get AO Rewards whenever you sell a referral. You get one point for every dollar of ALP that you sold. So Julie Ginny, how do I ensure that I get my AO Rewards credit for a referral sale? Um, I am not sure you have to, do you have to, I don't know. Ah, in EAP, once you put a veteran in the right-hand corner, there's a little box that says REF. You need to click that, right? Because that's a yeah. referral sale. And then the system or the back office is going to look to see if the person you sold to has already been identified as a lead. If they have not, you get the referral sale, okay? That's how you get a referral sale. So it takes a little bit of time uh, for you to get that credit. They try to get it done within the week that you sold the policy, but usually it's two weeks. Yes, Angelica. Yes, and for new people coming in, I used to get super excited, like, yeah, I did a McGruff because that script is kind of heavy for me and I'm very invested. So I did a McGruff and I write McGruff on top and then I go down to like the little blank box exit and write McGruff there. And, but it was a McGruff referral. So I just make sure like you're super excited about doing something new or doing something in general, you hit that referral. But also we have to register here on this website. So don't forget to register creator. Right, so the, to get the credit for the referral, you have to put it on uh, EAP properly, but you also have to be part of the AO Rewards Program, which your upline should be ensuring that you're part of. And you have to sign into this so that your agent ID is then tied from EAP into the referral program. Yes, Jerry, what do you got for me? Sam, so I was trying to do this earlier today. Um, it said that I need an Altig email account. How can I set that up? You already have an Altig email account. Where can I find it? First name, last name at altig.com. And all that is is a mirror account. So you okay. can't use it for anything you can receive email but it will then forward to whatever email you have in your uh altic profile roger that thank you mm -hmm. and it may be first name dot last name i forget i think it's just first name last name i'll try it out but thank you yeah thank try you. it out you actually send an email you should also try to send an email to yourself so first name last name at altic.com and it should automatically forward that email to your uh personal email that you used to get into Altic, yeah. For me, it's uh, Samuel Sweet AIL at gmail.com. All right, so we talked about the AO Rewards Program. Then we have AO TV, which I told you what that's about. You have AO Videos. Again, this is going to AO itself. So we'll talk about that in a minute. And then you've got down at the bottom, AO Workspace. So the AL workspace is the place we had to log in in order to do what? What did I have to do to log in here? What am I trying to do by logging in here? Do you guys remember? We we talked about this with EF. You have to have the ability to log in here to your agent workspace in order to download EF. Remember? And if you weren't able to do it, then you had to use your supervisor's login. So I'm going to show you the screen. If you have the ability to look into it, it's pretty important because you will always look at this screen probably 15 minutes after you sold something. Okay. So this is a part of the training, but I think it's important enough that I want to integrate this. So this screen, you should always look at after you sell. The reason why is your application, once it gets uploaded into impact or into the cloud and it goes through the business rules, it will show up right here. And you will see the description. You'll have the name that you sold to. It'll tell you when it's gonna be released to the SGA. It'll tell you if you collected any cash with the application, how much ALP, how much a &H, and most importantly, who you are. Make sure you put the right agent number on there. 
say the office, the name of the QA specialist, that's the person that's going to check for all those QA things, right? It's going to look for the medication that's going to be an automatic trial. All that stuff is done by the QA. And then your director typically is going to be your <clears throat> next person up. I think it's the MJ or higher. It'll tell you bank check. Hey, that's really important. It'll tell you, did it pass the bank check? Because the system's automated, we will check to see if it actually the banking information is correct. If it gives you a big red and says doesn't pass, you need to fix that because we're not going to pay you on it until we can actually draft from the bank. Any questions about the bank check status? That's super, super important. So then you have office. So it, when you move up into the business, all right, let me try this one first. Actually, when you first write your first piece of business, this little box would be checked right here when it gets submitted, or it'll show up right here and it'll say it's your first piece of business. Everybody gets notified when you sell your first policy. Everybody in your upline will know. And they should all be congratulating you because it's a big deal. I'm going to tell you, it's not... The fear spike goes up when you write your first piece of business. It's exciting. You went through the entire thing. You actually did it right. It showed up. They should all be congratulating you, okay? So once you do all that, <clears throat> if you sold four policies today, like I said, it takes about 15, 20 minutes for it to show up, but then it will all show up here. If you were an SA, GA, MGA, everybody in your, high, your downstream hierarchy, all their stuff will show up here. So this is one of the ways that I can look to see who's doing, who's submitting business for me on my team, okay? But if all I want is a quick snapshot, see how many points did you have, what did you sell? Then I can use the other screen, the production, which isn't the formal one, it's just what somebody told me they sold, right? This one tells me exactly what you sold and it tells me the status so I know if it's gonna go through or not. In addition, I can look at this thing and I can check uh, whether they're trials, whether they got canceled, whether they're standard. I can go back and look at what I've submitted in the past for a period of time. I can only go back three months. So I can go back to August 21st, say enter, uh, let's see, August 21st, say that. Yeah, so today I can do a search. And of course I'm doing training, so I don't have anything submitted. But you can see all the stuff that's submitted. So this will become a very important space for us once you get released, once you sell something. The other thing that I do, and I can't really show you here, which is a little frustrating, but if you sold something and it shows up here, there's gonna be a little symbol over here with an eye on it. What I want you to do is click on that little symbol of an eye and it will pop up with the actual P, uh, an actual image of the application in its entirety. You can save that to your computer, which is incredibly useful because it has everything on that person, right? Their phone number, their address, banking information, everything is on that which is fine because you're the one that actually wrote the application. So it's okay for you to have that data, correct? Yes, it's okay. You then save it. And if you need to go back and talk to that uh, client for any reason, you've got all the information about them that you submitted. It's incredibly powerful to have every application that you submitted because you never know when somebody's going to come back and say, hey, um, I want to add more coverage. Oh, hey, not a problem. You're using the same banking information? Yes, I am. Okay, let me put it all together for you. I'll call you when we're ready, and then we can actually do it, and it'll only take 10 minutes, right? As opposed to, I don't know, an hour going through that. So just so you guys can see, here's applications that I've written. Pictures and pictures of applications. Let's just take one back in the day, Christopher Luckman. I double click on that. Now, the way that it gets saved, it gets saved as a uh, image. Okay, and it shows up like that, which is really a pain. So you can just go to Adobe, change that image into a PDF file, and then it looks like this, which is the actual application with all the information on it. See that, Joshua? There you go. So it's really powerful to have that for the future. So you can always refer back to that if you need to. If you get a mod, 
and it shows up in your inbox, they will include a PDF of the application so you can see what you did and what needs to be changed. Does that make sense to everybody? So again, this screen will become incredibly powerful for you uh, once you start selling. And since I don't have any sales, I can't show you anything. But if Sean were to show us and he had agents that were writing business like today, they would show up down here. All his agency would know what they sold exactly. Okay. Hmm, Sam, uh, I had a question about like recruits. So for example, let's say you recruit someone and they recruit someone. Is that person they recruited also under your um, under your team, I guess? So it, so the, the <laughs> so the answer is yes, but not right away. So let me give you an example. If you were in my new hire class today, let's say it's Raphael. Okay, Raphael. And Raphael's like, hey, I'm going to recruit. I really believe in what Sam has done. I've shifted commitment to affirmation. I'm a true believer because I'm getting out of the service and I'm no longer going to be a captain. I'm like, okay, cool. You're going to recruit somebody. You recruit somebody today. They come into the system. They won't show up under you or be coded to you until you're an SA. So you actually have to move up and get your SA contract before this person can actually fall underneath you. However, oh, yeah, I understood you, that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but yeah, I understood that. But I was saying you like, let's camera say on, Connor, because I can't see you. Oh, no, I don't. Um, so if you were an essay and you uh, recruited someone and they recruited someone, this, the person you recruited recruited someone, they would be under you if you were an essay. <laughs> I'm not sure I understood, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to explain it. You tell me if what you asked is answered by what I say. That's right. Okay. If you're an essay and you recruit somebody in, then that person is going to be put under you immediately because you have an essay contract. If uh, Raphael works for me and he goes to this new hire class and in the process of the new hire class, he recruits somebody, that person will not be put under him until he has an SA contract. That'll be put under somebody else because we want him into the system, right? For that person. And once Raphael has his contract, we'll move that person over to them. Does that answer your question? Um, so like, let's say I recruited uh, Raphael and Raphael, and I'm an SA, I'm an SA at this point. And then Raphael yes. recruits someone his recruit is under me. Yes, until okay. he gets his essay contract and then it moves over. Okay, perfect. Okay, Because everybody gets to keep their personal recruits. However, as Sean can probably attest, there are times when it makes sense for the business to move people around depending upon the needs of the business that are not personal recruits. And by that, I mean, how I came in was not through a personal recruit. I came in as a person that applied for a job. So they can put me anywhere that they want. And at any time, they can move me out from under that hierarchy and put me under a different hierarchy. Does that make sense to everybody? But a personal recruit will stay within your hierarchy. Everybody tracking with me with what I'm saying. Angelica, do you have a question? So on the money aspect of that, if you have to put your new recruit under the SA, so who gets the finder's fee basically for the recruit? Oh, you will get the finder's fee. I, I'm not talking anything about finder's fee yet. I'm talking only about someone getting coded. They can only be coded to somebody who's at least an SA. Okay. And so then like, if you're in this new hire class and you're not an SA yet, but you recruit somebody and that person comes into the organization before you get promoted, then we're just going to put them under somebody else until you sign that SA contract. And then we're going to move them under you. However, you will get the recruitment bonus or the finder's fee. And Angelica, do you know what the finder's fee is? That was my next question uh, for personal versus uh, basically recruiting a client. Uh, good question. Sean, do you know what the finder's fee is? Did I lose Sean? Sean, <laughs> just when you give a, get a tough question, he bails out. I believe it's uh, $500 or $750. I, don't quote me on that for sure. $750 is like, what I heard. There you go, $750. So you will get that. So it's worth it to you to recruit even if they don't last. And they have to last for a certain period of time though before that gets paid out. 
just so you know, you can't just give them a name and they'll pay you seven fifty. You got to give them a name. You got to go through training. You got to actually go through everything. Stay for a period of time, and then you get that one. Okay. Uh, does anybody else? No, Jason. Did you have your hand raised? Well, one second. Can I? So, how much is it for the if like you sit with a client and you recruit a client? Do you know that one? It's a personal recruit. Even if you sit with a client. Yeah, because you're the one that actually recruited them in, regardless if they're a policy owner or not, or you sold something to them. It's your recruit. The differentiation between a personal recruit and corporate recruit is you recruited somebody as opposed to the company paying recruiters to come in, and then they just plug them in wherever they want. Okay. So as an example, next year, I'll probably get some agents that are assigned to me, but they're not my personal recruits. So I'm going to keep them for as long as the company or as long as my upline wants me to have them. Then if something changes, they can move them. A personal recruit, though, stays with you for as long as you're with the organization. Okay, okay. And I don't get any credit for any of those corporate recruits. I don't get the referral bonus. Okay. okay? All right. And Sean and Emily probably, uh, we had they had a three o'clock manager meeting. That's probably where they went. Oh yeah, it is Thursday. Yeah, so yeah. those are important. We can't miss it. Yeah, no, it's it's fine. Right. Uh, Ruben Lloyd, go ahead. So, uh, how many uh, uh, recruits can you have underneath? Underneath. Well, we'll talk about that tomorrow. I'll break it down, okay. but I'm going to tell you, you can have as many as you want. Okay. As many as you can recruit. The issue is, you can <laughs> only have five report directly to you. I got you. Okay. So if you okay. recruit six people, do you get credit for that sixth person? Yes. Are they going to follow directly under you? No, but they're part of your hierarchy. Because here's what's happened. If you have five people and you recruit a sixth, you're going to put them under one of those people. Gotcha. And that person you're going to put them under will then be promoted to an essay. So they're always going to be in your hierarchy if you personally recruit, which is why we have recruiting contests all the time, because we want more people because we're generating more leads than we have agents for, number one, and we're doing referrals, which means even more. But the reality is, is we never want recruiting to stop. So we will continue to recruit. You will see uh, SAs, GAs, MJs, RJs, SJs, Rick Altig still recruits. Why would Rick Altig recruit? Because he runs the, yeah, he still recruits. Okay. Angelica, do you still have your hand up from before or do you have another question? I'm fine. No, sorry. Okay. Gotcha. I think I'm still showing my screen, right? So let's get out of this and go back to home. So we've gone through now this entire thing for uh, Mobile Planet relative to the left-hand side. So now let's take a look at the right-hand side. Uh, just to give you some house clean, cleaning, housekeeping items, we'll have our uh, survival and success uh, panel tomorrow instead of today, okay? All right, so over here, you always have the AO sales calls. We can watch all the previous recordings. We can join the sales call from here. We have our career pathways. We're going to go into that ad infinitum tomorrow. We've got videos that's over here. And then I think Ricardo was telling us about AO training. This is a really good because it didn't exist two months ago. This has a lot of vignettes is what I'll call them, small little uh, videos that talk about various parts of our business. Our simple electronic application, otherwise known as eApp, if I click on this, I then get to the Vimeo. It says the showcase is private. Oh yeah, so you gotta use the password is 2022. So I just click on 2022. And what this then does is gives us all broken down. Again, little videos on how do I install the app? How do I fill up the super combo? How do I explain the final remarks video? Why and how do I unlock the application? What should I send a client when we're done? When should I mark other? Tips for collecting bank if I mean, all kinds of stuff that I've gone through and taught you everything. But again, you may forget, you may not be, uh, uh, or I may not have addressed it to your satisfaction. You can always go here. Okay, so that's under AO training and that's under the E app. We've got learn how we protect our customers and more videos about our products. How do I get paid? Well, let's click on that. How do I get paid? 
what videos are in here. Of course, it's a little slow. But when I click on it, I get the builder's bonus. I get, what is ALP? What does that mean? What is the world's greatest bonus? I heard Sam talk about it, but now that I got paid on it, what, how does it work? What are renewals and how do I get paid on that? What is a growth bonus? And you're going to see why all these all make sense tomorrow when I go through the comp plans for every role. What is AOL rewards, right? You can click on that and get a two-minute video on AOL rewards. Which is going to be a let's let's just click on it. let's see what it has to say. What is the What's AO? AO? I'm going to talk about AO rewards. AO is actually the only agency in all of American Income Life that offers any type of rewards program like this. We partnered with travel companies like Delta and Marriott, as well as cruise lines and charities, and also places like Gucci and Prada. So there's something for everyone. So let me show you how you sign up for AO Rewards and start earning your points. When you log on to Planet, there's two places that you can find AO Rewards on the homepage. One is on the left side toolbar, you'll see AO Rewards. And then also if you scroll down just a little bit, it's in the middle of the homepage too. Either one you want, you just click on it. It's gonna take you to the homepage of AO Rewards. And the first thing that you do is sign up. You sign up just by entering your first and last name and your email create a password. When you hit register, they will send you an email that you just verify that you've received this in your email. Your email will look like this. When you hit verify email, then it will automatically take you where you can hit return to application. And now just log in with the email and password you created and you're here. The next thing that you need to do is just start collecting and converting plus leads into ALP. You'll want to make sure that you mark your sales properly so that your AO rewards will be added up. When you click on redeem on the AL rewards page, it's going to explain to you exactly how to do this. Step one is to make sure that your referrals are first entered into your referral tool. Then when you make a sale, you'll want to make sure that you note the affiliation as a referral in eApp. And the last thing is to resolve your matching lead as a sale. Once you do that, then we will verify everything and your rewards will automatically be added. Once you get enough rewards for what you want, then you can come back to this site later to book your travel, book your charity, or anything that you want. Hopefully you love this exciting way to earn extra things just for doing our job. AO, let's grow. So, hey, what happened here? How do I get out of it? Okay, there we go. So there you go. So there's um, everything about AO Rewards. How do I get promoted? You get a two minute video on how to get promoted. Let's just watch that real quick, and then I won't make you watch any more videos, but these are Let's important. Today, we're going to talk about how to get promoted. It's actually one of my favorite things to talk about because we have a career opportunity that is absolutely unlimited. AO is so special because all of our promotions are completely based on results. Everything else doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter age, race male, female, it doesn't matter how long you've been with the company, how short you've been with the company, it doesn't matter who is above you, you're not waiting for anyone to retire, you're not waiting for anyone to leave the company, anyone can get promoted as long as you just follow our career path, it's in black and white, so you know exactly what you need to do to get where you want to be. So let me show you what that looks like. You can easily find the career path yourself by going to Planet. On the home page, on the right side, you'll see two boxes. One is the business builders pathway, and one is the path to partnership. If we start with the business builders pathway, on here you'll see every position that you can promote to, as well as how you do it. So for example, the first position that you'll wanna get ready to promote to is a supervising agent. It shows you here to promote to this position, all you need to do is recruit and code one new agent or make 10 sales in a month. It goes over your compensation increases. There's going to be weekly bonuses with that. And it also shows you your projected earnings. So for example. So can all of you get promoted to SA? Yes. What does it take for you to get promoted to SA? Angelica, what does it take? What does it take to get promoted to SA? So right now, the new people that came in are just an agent. Let me uh, stop this. 
Someone I was in Mario's told, meeting. We had that three o'clock. Unless you're blind. Yeah, that's the agency. But you're yeah, so you're an you know agent, you right? Like you're starting off right now. We're basically learning our primary colors in art class. So you're an agent, off, and then you get your general agent contract. All right, right, but how long does it take to become an SA? That's number one for the week. What it takes to become an SA? You either could, I have no clue about an SA. The SA is the first, okay, go ahead and meet you. Jason Radford, what does it take to become an SA? Uh, you need to be doing 10 personal sales a month or recruit one new agent. No. What does it take to become an SA? Raphael. <laughs> that was the same answer I was going to answer. Mary Sandoval. Dennis. Uh, you need... I mean, you got to recruit one person. No, 10. No, 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 no. Five recruits. Dennis. <laughs> you need uh, 10 sales in a month and you need one recruit. No. Ruben. And that was what I was going to say. <laughs> Justin. On sales and five recruits. No. Crystal. Um, it was 10 sales a month. You have to recruit one new agent. And then there's some other things there. Let me no. go back. No. Oh, but that's what it says. It says expectation. No. I'm going to show you. Personally recruited one, one new agent. Personally recruit and code one new agent. That's all it takes to become an SA. To stay as an SA, you need to do 10 sales a month and recruit oh, okay. one That's a month, okay? That, but to get promoted, you just need to personally recruit and code one new agent. Now, coding is the tricky part, right? Because I can recruit everybody all day long. They have to go through the state mandated training. They have to get their license. They have to go through the two week training course. They then actually have to sell something. During all that time, if I've only had one person, am I an SA yet? No. I don't become an SA until that agent is coded. You tracking with me? But that's all it takes. One new agent that gets coded. Or I can do 10 sales in a month and train and code one new agent. Do you see the difference there? So if I do the second part, I make 10 sales in a month and I train and code one new agent. Did I recruit that agent? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe the company gave them to me, right? But for all of you, if you want to get promoted to SA, the fastest, you recruit somebody and then you code them. They sell their first deal. That's what it takes to become an SA. And then the expectations are 10 sales a month, and then you have to actually recruit code and add at least one new person a month. Does that make sense to everybody? So all of you become an SA in a very short period of time. Okay. Everybody tracking. Everyone now knows what does it take, Dennis, to become an SA? Uh, so, like you said, I mean, you need to con to continuously stay. Uh, what does it take to become an SA? A personal recruit and code one new agent or make 10 sales in a month. And then trade and code a new agent. Okay. Correct. So, some, and the reason there's a difference, guys, is that sometimes... Like when I came in, I didn't want to recruit anybody. I didn't know if I was ready for the business, but the business saw that maybe I have leadership ability and I can train people. So maybe they gave me people. I didn't personally recruit them, but they gave them to me. So they promoted me to SA. I trained and coded them, right? But then I stopped doing that. So then they took them away and put them somewhere else. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But if I recruit somebody and they get coded, then not only am I going to become an SA, but they stay in my hierarchy forever because they're my personal recruit. Does that make sense? Now, I'm not telling you to go out and recruit your friends or recruit your family and do all that. What I'm telling you is recruit. If you want to move into leadership and make more money, become an SA, start the process, recruit somebody. And the way I recruit people is I go on LinkedIn, I put a job posting up there, people apply, I put them through the system. And if they're interested and they go through the state training and get licensed, boom, I've got people. So let's see what else she has to say now that we know what it takes at least to get to the first level. Is recruit and code one new agent or make 10 sales in a month? It goes over your compensation increases, 
There's going to be weekly bonuses with that. And it also shows you your projected earnings. So for example, in the first level promotion as the SA, when you have your five people on your team and each of those five only makes one sale per week, the projected earnings are $82,510 for the year. And you can also see if you teach your five to make two sales in a week, three sales in a week, et cetera. So make this your first goal is to promote to the SA position. From there, you'll see the details to get to the general agent, the master general agent, the regional general agent, and you can even become a partner and a senior partner. So if you see yourself getting in the leadership position, you should get really familiar with the AO brochure. And the next step would be to meet with your mentor to make sure you have a plan in place to get everything that you want. AO, let's grow. So promotions. So I'm going to give you my two cents on promotions and why I think every single one of you should at least become an SA. You may not want to be in management. You don't want to be in leadership. I get all that. But all of you here are to make money. And every other job that you've held, the amount of money that you make typically is predicated on your bandwidth, right? So if you have a nine to five job, you get paid a certain amount of money every single year or every hour, and you have to do the work in order to get paid. Fair? So if you don't work or do enough work, we let you go. Or if you're hourly and you don't work a certain number of hours, we're only going to pay you for the hours that you actually did work. Okay. But we're in a business where we are kind of managing our own business. The best way for us to make money has to have multiple streams of income. Okay. So I know I'm one stream. So when I work and I sell any policies, I'm going to get paid. I get paid pretty good for doing that. But I want to make more money than just that. So I now want to move myself up to SA. I have five people working for me. And I have my own revenue stream. So I have six potential revenue streams coming in, right? If I decide I want to take Christmas off, or if I'm sick, I don't want to work that day. These five people may still be working because they're hustling. They want to get paid. I'm still going to get paid my bonuses and my leadership off of what they do, even though I personally didn't work that week. So that means I have multiple streams of income coming in, correct? So for all of us that want to make money and we're working in a job where we don't work nine to five, we work whatever hours we want, we train people. If you get alternate um, streams of income coming in, it mitigates your risk of not having income coming in because you aren't doing something. That's the number one reason in my mind that people want to move up is they want to make more money. Now, for me, it wasn't about the money. It was about moving up and I'm not there yet, but as I continue to move up, it's about helping people, training people and actually have an impact on an entire sales force. That's what I like to do. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing now. I'm doing the training part. But for all of you, as you start this process, yes, you're going to learn what you're going to do. But then does it make sense to get a few people under you as an essay? Absolutely, because you have a chance to make a lot more money. Any questions about your very first promotion opportunity? We're going to go into it more tomorrow. But basically, what we were talking about here was the various trainings that are available to you here. So I was showing you the money, secrets to success, work from anywhere. This is the Zoom setup. All this information is in here. All these videos that Danny puts out on these various subjects. They're usually very small videos, by the way, so it doesn't take a whole lot of time to get a little bit of information, okay? So let's go back here to the dashboard. That's training. We have market resources here. You can click on that, and it will give you uh, all the types of resources that we have in various areas. Will kits, McGruff training, the veteran lead training. Hey, we've got a whole thing on veteran. Oh, what's that about? Maybe I should have just given you this and not have you do a two-week class. Hey, it's only one dot. There you go. If I gave you that, that would be the training. It would be done. <laughs> the entire veteran training completely over. Anyway, this is what it looks like when it comes into your uh, lead box. But in this case, it's filled out by hand, but in actuality, it would be type uh, computer generated. It goes for Facebook. You end up with the email, phone number, the address, the time and date, and the security keyword. They typically don't fill in the branch of service, uh, and you don't have their birthday. Okay, but that's what it will actually look like. All right, go back here. So we have all of that. All right, 
So go back to the dashboard. AO Rewards, she showed you where that was. Talk about that. You can get the episode of AO TV there. There's information about the Glick RX prescription plan. Is Sunel still with us? Sunel, Sunel. Is it just me or do I keep losing people throughout the day? It's probably just me. <laughs> anyway, he was doing the Glick RX program. If you want to know what that is, you can click right there. It'll give you information about it. I like that program. We don't uh, talk about the veterans training simply because it's part of the art. It's another uh, pre-qualified benefit that's available to anybody. But what's in it for you is if you get somebody to sign up for this, then every time they get the prescription re renewed, you get paid a dollar or two dollars. I forget which one it is. So if you do this for every single person you sell to or every single person you sit with, whether they buy from you or not, you can make a nice revenue stream coming in just from that. Not only about you, but a couple hundred bucks a month extra would be nice, right? The uh, ladies rising, this is going to be for women in the organization. We have a, a website dedicated to them. We have videos, what is lady rising, all the calls that they have. They usually do one call a month. Uh, they have an Instagram feed, they have merchandise, and you can recruit specifically for women. And the reason that this started, and I don't know if I went into this with this class, but when I was young, the amount of men in this business in terms of percentage was up here. The amount of women was, I mean, let me see, just barely above the camera level, right? And now it went up over time as I got older, but it was still a huge disparity. And the reason for that is guys like me, who has twin girls, I did not encourage them to work in insurance. The reason I didn't encourage them to work in insurance is because prior to uh, two years ago, you actually had a territory and you drove your car and you sat in a stranger's home and you pitched them for the most part. Didn't want my daughters going into strangers. So I don't know about you, but it just wasn't something I was interested in having them do. However, now that we have Zoom, now that we have everything set up to do everything remotely, what we're seeing is that the percentage of men versus the percentage of women is now doing this. AO International, I think, has now more women than men. That's an amazing statistic, and that's awesome. And so because of that, we have the ladies rising to give information specifically to women. As an example, a single mother, what are the challenges she's going to run into doing this business, working from home with a child under the age of five, let's say, or a child that's in high school or whatever. Ladies rising talks to that issue, brings it up, shares stories of how people were able to accommodate that, what they were willing to do. I can tell you from personal experience, not being a single mother, but managing sales teams for years, AO is probably one of the best organizations I've ever seen at making sure that women with children are taken care of just as well as men who are out there hustling. If you want to work, you want to get paid, we will work with you to figure out how best to set everything up so you can succeed. So now, today, if my kids were a little bit younger, I would encourage the girls to be in this business. Because quite frankly, and this is just my personal opinion, women have an excellent track record in opening up a conversation. I guarantee you, for me personally, if someone who's a woman calls me on the phone talking about benefits with uh, AIL, I'm probably going to listen to her. I'll probably book an appointment with her. If Raphael calls me like, hey, sir, blah, 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 I'm going to be like, oh, you're just a sales guy. I'm just telling you how it is. Women typically can get conversations opened up every single time. And so they're doing extraordinarily well in this business. They're making lots and lots of money. A lot of them are getting promoted up to RGA. And she actually, Rust just got promoted to RGA a month ago. We're promoting people like crazy. This is awesome. All right. Anyway, I'll get off that. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Going back to the dashboard, you got AO Vamos. We talked about that. Then you got virtual recruiting, virtual sales. Let's look at, for recruiting, that's where you would go to to get information about recruiting, right? So if you click on this, you can get the recruiting process. You can learn what it takes to get through final interviews, the builder space, all this type of stuff when you're ready for that. However, the thing that we're going to focus on right here is virtual sales. Yes, Jerry. Hey, Sam, for AO Vamos, is there like a, uh, some sort of training that I got to take for the Spanish presentation? So that, how does that work? Yeah, what I would do is join the AO Vamos call and then talk to one of those folks who run that. And then they'll walk you through it because we have everything in Spanish. Um, 
but you've got to make sure that you don't get trapped into only getting Spanish leads. Roger that. Yeah. Thank you. Make sure you get all the leads and yes, you can do Spanish. I can do and, both markets, right? Uh, I, I believe the answer is yes, but you have to talk to your upline <laughs> okay. because I'm not the one that hands out the leads. I'm just saying, uh, in my experience, the you want to make sure you can get every lead possible within the veteran market. Don't get restricted to just one type. Okay. All right. So the virtual sales, we're going to click on here. All of us will be going to this page invariably at some point or another. You have the scripts that are at the AO level. They're not the scripts for AO International. Everybody has kind of their own script and how they follow. Use the AO international scripts. You have e-signatures. Well, what the heck is an e-signature? This is when you have to have an amendment signed, questionnaires need to be filled out, waivers, writers, bank draft forms, all this stuff is here. So whenever you have something that needs to be signed after you've done the initial application, you're probably going to have to go to this website to get it done. If you submit a policy and no one or the person never pays on it, then we say NTO or not taken out. And then they come back three months later, like, oh, yeah, I didn't have money in the account. I want to do it now. You need to reopen that policy. You shouldn't write a new one. And when you do that, you click here on reopens and go to reopen. Reinstatement is similar, but it is different. You should click on this or talk to your upline about when you would use reinstatements. Okay. So you're gonna go here for various things. You have weekly Zoom sales training. We talked about that. We have how-to videos. These are gonna be similar to the training videos. We have Zoom resources. We have presentation documents, AL Plus, and then Rick's recipe card, which I'll talk about tomorrow, not today. If you go in here, you can go to the agent uh, workspace on this side. You can go to the bank account verification, which is the same one we showed you before. You can see what you should send the customer after a sale. You can get all the training, all the information about HP Pro and various other things in here, the no cost benefits. Okay, so this will become very value, ah, sorry, very, very familiar to you all as you start selling because you're gonna have to come here to get information. Any questions about what this is that I'm showing you? We talked about, uh, 10-year renewable convertible conversions, right? In the whole life, you won't do these for a long period of time unless you work in POS, but invariably you're going to have to convert one at some point and then no one remembers how to do it because it's so infrequent. You come into e-signatures as part of virtual sales, you scroll down and then you fill out the super combo for the state that it's in. Now, when you click on this, it doesn't act like a normal e-app. It goes through a completely different process. You'll see a digital representation of e-app, uh, but it is not e-app. It's basically a paper application that's done electronically, and then you submit it via email. So get with your upline if you ever need a converted 10-year RNC. So that's the virtual sales. Then you have our annual report that we put out. These are recruiting information that you can use to give to somebody. How are we doing? What did we do in 2022? And it's at the beginning of the year that gets put out, talks about the past. And there's our report that we talk about what we have going on, right? It's very small because it's not something that's being used for uh, financial numbers. It's just talking about what we have done. So in 2021, 2020, we made a seamless transition to virtual sales and now associates can work from the safety of their homes while setting record months of growth by protecting families. Yeah, our growth is astronomical because more people want to work in the insurance business where they can work from home. And now because we're not limited by territories, we can sell by state, the amount of money we can make has exploded. We can literally sell to all 48 states. We can sell to Canada if we wanted to and even New Zealand. Okay, and the actual report that would go out uh, is for Globe Life. That would be where the financials would go out if you wanted to see an actual annual report from them. We have $161 million in assets, there's 2,700 licensed associates in AO, 10,000, a little under 10,000 in AIL itself. And there's all the different working groups that we have, some additional facts. You guys can take a look at this. 
kind of see what we do and who we are. We have the AO briefing, more information. We talk about work from home. This is a website. Whenever I recruit, I send this website to people because it gives information and a lot of video. Last year, we did $76 million. $76 million in ALP with a little under 2,500. And it's aoworkfromhome.com. Okay? Mom's an AO. How do we handle that? What is our company? Here's our policy. There's ladies rising. All kinds of videos. If you want to join the team, you can click on that. Meet Jess Chang. She's been promoted. She's done very well. Carrington Hanna was a rookie of the year uh, two years ago, I think now. There's an AO rewards program. So if you want to recruit somebody, you can send them to this website. They can learn everything about what we do and how we do it in terms of the big picture. Not the nitty gritty of like, what does it mean to be an insurance agent? But just a larger, more strategic picture. Then you've got how uh, the AIL Plus program works. We talk about our convention, every game in HP Pro, the process, everything here under the sun. What time is it? It's 1230. So I am going to play this video. This is Rick Altig. He is the chairman of AO, not AO International. That's Mario Hiro. He has all kinds of people uh, below him. That's, I'm oh, sorry. Mario Hiro's boss is Rick Altig. I mean, there's other people there, but Rick Altig is the one who manages the entire organization as the chairman of AO. Okay, so we're gonna play this video. He's gonna explain how you get paid. And he's also gonna explain your second contract in leadership. And then we'll chat a little bit after that about what he talked about, okay? Any questions before I play this video? Nope, all right, perfect. Let's play, uh, let's see what happens. It's important to always understand your contract with AO and American Income Life. You know, whether you're first starting with the company or you've been here a long time, a lot of times we don't take the time to really understand how do you make money? We think more about selling insurance and helping people. And sometimes we forget about ourselves and how we make money. What I love about American Income, and especially the AO exclusive, is that we have two contracts. Every single one of you have access to two contracts at American Income. Those contracts are a personal production contract where you get paid on the personal production that you do here at the company. And the second contract is your leadership contract. Let's talk a little bit about if you're brand new to the company, how do you actually activate those contracts and get them going? Well, it's pretty simple. If you're brand new with the company and you want to get your personal production contract going, you want to get access to that 50 or 60% commission just to get started. Well, the way you do that is you go to school, you get your license. And as soon as your license comes through that day, you write a piece of business on anyone and that will actually activate your contract with the company so you can get access to all the benefits of that contract. Now, how do you make money on personal production? Well, we talk about that. You go in the field five days a week and you see people from 12 to nine, nine to six. You wanna see people at least uh, four people a day. And for sure, one person will enroll every day. Now, as you get better and better, you'll have one and a half enroll, or you'll have two people enroll. And some of our people even have more, or they go and see more people. But I like to talk about just the small amount. Let's just say you see your four people a day and only one person enrolls. Well, we all know today that we're asking that all of you have at least an average of a $1,200 sale. That's $1,200. So when you enroll someone in the average size sale of 1,200, that means on average, you're gonna get about $600 when you enroll them or about half. Now remember when I'm giving you these figures, it's just me talking to you 
I don't have my pencil out and I don't have calculators out. I'm trying to teach you how to make money and how to think. So 600 times five is what? It's $3,000 a week. That's $150,000 a year. And say you're really proficient. You see four people a day and you enroll two a day. Well, you'd be making 1,200 a day times five days a week. That's $6,000 a week times 50 weeks in a year. Now you're in the $300,000 a year class. Do you understand how that works? And that's not even accounting your residual income that starts paying the second year and for life. And the reason I say life, because as long as you stay with American income, you are vested for life. If for some reason you decide to leave the company before 10 years, there's a vesting schedule that's in writing. But as long as you're here at least 10 years, you're paid for life. If you are staying with the company and you're just brand new, you're still vested for life unless you leave before 10 years. Does that make sense? So there's a lot of money on the table for personally producing. And Rick, you said there's two contracts. What's the other one? Well, they give you the opportunity at American Income to teach others. And what a great thing in life where you can actually teach others to do what you do. You can show others to do what you do in the company richly rewards you for teaching others. Now, what I like to do is I like to think in these terms, half of my money comes from my personal sales and half of my money comes from my leadership for teaching others. And we have a rule here at AO is you can have up to five people that are part of your team. Not six, not 10, but you can have five people that are directly coded to you on your team. So how do I get compensated on that second contract where well, you want to bring in your five people? We have other information available to teach you how to bring people in, but it, it's pretty simple. You just tell them and let them go on a working interview with you or one of your leaders where they can actually see what you do and how you make money. And it's very simple. I take people with me, they watch me, and I make money personally producing. They watch me and they learn. And then when they go out, you get compensated based on how they do. So let's just go through the numbers again. So you help somebody come into the business, they go out and they do that same example as you. They go out there five days, they see four people a day and they make that one sale. They're just kind of average. They don't do that well. And it's a 1,000. $200 sale, $100 a month, they make $600. Well, what do you get? Well, you get what's called a supervising agent's contract. When you add up the commissions and all the bonuses, this is what I put in my end, you end up receiving about 25% of whatever the person makes. Now, so let's kind of do the math like that. If you're making $750 a week because they're doing one sale, each day, and you have five people, because remember, you can have up to five people. What's five times 750? What is that, 3,750 or something like that a week, right? That's not bad money for helping five people, but you forgot something. You have your personal production income that's also coming in because remember, you're enrolling one person a day. And how much are you getting for enrolling one person a day? Well, on that contract, you were getting 3,000, plus you have your 3,750 a week for your five people that enroll one person a day. That's $6,750 a week. So you understand now you've got two contracts. You have a personal production and you have a leadership contract. And then it starts to get even better. And what you can now do is you help each of your five people get what you got. So now you help them get their leadership contract as well. So you help them get their, how many people? Five people, not six, not 10, but they're five people. And the company richly rewards you for that because now you're moving up to what's called the MGA, the master general agent level. I could go through the money with you today, but it starts to be mind boggling. So I'm going to challenge you today. 
I'm going to challenge you each to activate both of your contracts. And even if you're only a personal producer right now, why don't you help bring in some people, let them ride with you, let them learn, and then let them go out and get what you got in this business and be richly rewarded. And I'll give you a hint. Some people say, well, I don't really need the money, Rick. I don't need the extra money. Well, you know what? It's not about you. It's about helping others. And imagine you can use this vehicle to help others in your family, in your neighborhood, in your city, in your community, or even people throughout the world. You could dedicate that extra income to doing something way bigger than you by utilizing both your contracts. Get in there and activate both your contracts today. All right, so that's directly from Rick. <clears throat> Any questions about that? Everyone gets it, no questions. All right, awesome, that's great. Uh, and again, I'm passionate about building a sales force, building a team that we retain and keep around. So if you start to do the math, you can see really quickly that you can start making a pretty good amount of money. And what I'm most interested in, if I were you, is that my money that I'm getting paid out isn't only based on my own efforts. If I have a down month, but I have a team underneath me, I can still make pretty good money for that month, right? So there's a lot of upside to uh, recruiting and having a team. And that's why we encourage you to start recruiting now. Don't wait, right? I've seen people become SAs within two weeks and become GAs within a month because they had a whole retinue of people behind them that they recruited into the business. I'm not saying you guys have to do that, but if you start thinking about it and you know that you have a two-week training course where you don't have to train these folks yourself, right? It helps you. Imagine when we didn't have a training course and you have other agencies that are trying to do this without a two-week training course, how difficult it is for you as an SA. Because you have to start from scratch. You have to explain everything. And so what we've seen is that when that has to be done, recruiting may have been at this level, it shrinks down because people just don't have the time. They got to make their own money. But now that we have a two-week training course, we're seeing recruiting go up because all these folks know that if they put people through the program, they don't have to bear the entire brunt themselves. Okay. Does that make sense? I just have a quick oh. question. Um, I do have a friend that is um, working on a resume right now. She wants to apply for this for this position as well. So where would she go to fill out her application since I want her to be able to stay with you? Like on me yeah, with me. Yeah, you, so you're in our admin. Um, sorry, you're in my hierarchy. So your mm -hmm. admin is Amanda Hiro. You're going to send an email to Amanda and say, hey, I want Jill Smith to attend the, uh, the agency overview, which is held every Tuesday and Thursday at 11 a.m. Oh, she okay. Attends uh, she says, yes, I'd like to join. They do a final interview with her. That looks good. They'll put her, they'll give her all the information for the training. That's 11 a.m. your time? Because I think we're two hours difference. 11 a.m. Pacific time. Okay, so it would be 11 that's yeah, one. just send an email to Amanda and say, hey, I got somebody that I want to at have attend the agency overview. She'll give you the information. Okay, cool. All righty. I'll let Natasha know. She'll also know that uh, that person is recruited by you. That's okay. really important to make sure that if you have personal recruits, you get the credit for personal recruits. That's why I want yeah. to make sure I go about it the right way so I, I do get the credit for it. Yep. All right, cool. Thanks. You know what you're doing and you're good to go. All right, so we are in fact going to have our uh, survival and success panel tomorrow instead of today. So what I'm going to do is give all of you a form to fill out because what I have learned is that it makes more sense for the facilitator, that'd be me, not to provide the questions to the panel. Right, because I have my own mind, what I think you should know and all that. It actually makes more sense for you all to submit your questions to me about what you would like. My job as a facilitator is to make sure I move the conversation along, make sure that the answers are gonna be aligned with whatever we taught you throughout the entire course. There have been times where I've gotten questions where 
uh, I didn't address it in the course. I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. That helps me fix, uh, not fix, but helps me modify the course in a way that is useful for the students, okay? So here is the question uh, form. Go ahead and fill it out. You get two questions, your primary and your secondary, and they can you can ask anything. And I'm not guaranteeing that I'm going to have it answered by the panel, but more than likely I will, unless the question is crazy and totally off balance. Um, but one, I believe, will be Brenna uh, Behan. The other one will be Morgan Boneberg. I'm going to try to get a third person. These are folks who uh, are either one or two years in, uh, and they will have gone through everything that you went through, except they didn't get a two-week training class. They got put into the fire right away. I think you really just need to know agent. I don't know what that means. Kim? Um, what you... Angelica was asking about the rankings again, and she said S-A-G-A -A stuff. And I was still typing, but I accidentally entered, so I didn't mean to send that yet. But okay. I think she's confused on, I don't know if she's confused on like who's above who, or if she's confused on what each, like what SA stands for, what GA stands oh, for. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not completely sure what exactly she's confused on, so I was about to type a bunch. No, she's still here. Okay, Angelica, uh, while you guys are doing that, I'm going to show you what the different levels are, okay? Mm -hmm. For everybody. And then we're going to cut you loose. But please, I'm asking all of you to submit one or two questions. You don't have to write a flowery description of your question. If you just want to know about certain areas, I will take that in as I facilitate the panel. I'm going to look at the questions that we have. I'm going to say, hey, they want to know about X, Y, and Z. Or what did you think was your greatest challenge? What do you think new hires need to know coming out of this class? Anything like that, right? What we're looking for is for you to ask questions of somebody who's gone through the process of being an agent and now they're a, either an SA or a GA. What do you want to know from the horse's mouth? And if they're not in your hierarchy, that's even better because you won't be held against you, <laughs> right? But it gives you good information in order to... Uh, understand what's going on because I could tell you everything all day long, but it's my interpretation from a totally different perspective. I want the perspective given to you of somebody who's been where you are before. Okay. So let me share my, uh, yeah, while I'm doing that. Go ahead, Jesse. You have a question? I, I think you said form. I don't know if you're dropping a form in the chat or for the email. The you. No, I put it in the chat. So just click on that link and it will take you to another job form. And you just fill it out and answer the two questions. At least I think I did that. Yeah, questions for our guests. So. I don't see it. Yeah, there's it's not. A yeah, I don't see it either. Wait a minute. I did put it. Oh, you know, I sent it to Sandra only. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, I was going to say, I, I see it. I'm gold. There it is for everybody. <laughs> well, Sandra. Uh, Sandra can do it for all of us. <laughs> You were picked. <laughs> anyway, you fill that out and it says, you know, the typical who you are, whatever. What's your question for the panelists? What's your second question? Okay. And if you don't want to submit a question or if you don't want to submit a second question, just put NA. But I do need you to fill out the form so that I know I gave you the opportunity. Okay. All right. So while you're doing that, let me show you what I said I was going to show you. Hopefully, I will get there. Dashboard. We're going to go to Business Builder Pathway. All right. And let me share my screen. And these are the different levels. And I'm going to get passionate about this again. So don't mistake my passion as for being aggressive. I'm not. I just am a big believer in what we do and how we do it. Okay. Share my screen and go to Business Builder Pathway. All right. So... Can you see my screen? Yeah. So this is the business builder pathway. As she was saying, you're supervising agent. All you need to do is recruit and code one new agent, or you can make 10 sales and then train and code a new agent. The differentiator there is one is a personal recruit. The other one is a recruit given to you by the corporate company. I'm going to tell you that when you first start out, the company's not going to give you people. You need to recruit. That's just the nature of the business. Okay. So Bruce Tan made $209,000 in 2021. Okay. 
compensation, the way it works. He got 16.7% of what the agents received in vested renewals. Okay. So they get 5% and you get 16.7%. They still get their 5%. It's just on top of that, you get 16.7%. Does that make sense? So if you sold a policy that was $1,200, it renewed, then $1,200 times 5% is what you're going to get for the renewal, right? So 1,200 times 0.05 is equal to $60 times 0.16 is equal to $9. So basically you're getting $10 on every renewal, which I don't know about you, but I'd love to get $10 without having to lift a finger, right? Without having to do anything. From every person that's in my hierarchy, every renewal they get, I'm getting 10 bucks. That starts to add up. You get 25% of what the agents receive on their first $15,000 of ALP. And after that, you get 4.2%. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So $15,000 on my first 15,000, right? I make about 7,500 bucks. And what we're saying is the SA gets 25% of that. So again, I'm not the fastest in math, but 7,500 times 0.25 is equal to 1870. I'm getting almost $2,000 for every time somebody sold something in the first 15,000. So, okay, that they don't last very long. The first 15,000 will be sold pretty quick. What matters is what I'm getting next. I get 4.2%. Okay, every single time I sell something, I'm getting 4.2%. So... Do the math. I sell a thousand dollars, or my agent sells a thousand dollars. They're going to get paid fifty percent of that, so they're going to get five hundred. I'm going to get four point two percent. Right? Am I right? Am I wrong? Anybody? What happened to this class, Sandra? Are you with me? Come on. I'm a little confused. Sounds right. Okay, Sam. that's what I want to know. If we're confused, okay. So yeah. let's start the first, so the first line. Do we understand this one? I understand what you're saying, but when you say they get 50% and then the, the okay. upline, so, they get... All right, let's do it then. This is the one we're talking about. You get up to 25% of what your agents receive on their first 15,000 ALP and 4.2% afterward. So your so you person... off of their path? So I'm going to give you an example. So you have an upline, you have an essay, let's say it's Joe. Okay. You sell $2,000. Yeah. Joe is going to get up to 25% of what you receive. So your commission. So you have first have to calculate your commission on that first $1,000. Your commission is 50%, right? Right. And then I'm going to get 25% of that $500, right? Of so my $500? Yeah, or but just, it's not from yours. It gets okay. paid in addition. That was my money. question. Yeah, and nothing I didn't gets taken that. from you. That's okay. the beauty of this game. Nothing gets taken from you as the agent. Okay, I'm not confused anymore. <laughs> so I want you to think about how profitable this is, this business. You get paid on everything in the first year, and then you get 5% of renewals. The company gets 95% of all renewals. That's why the company is able to pay out such huge amounts of money, because it's a very profitable business. Mm -hmm. Jerry Sandoval, you're saying, so you make 21 bucks from them from the other 500. So 25% of 500 is $21? Is that what you're telling me? Well, you make 4.2% uh, off of the after. Yeah. So once they get past the first $15,000, you're going to get paid 4.2%. Oh, I see. Okay. I thought you were talking about only the 500 bucks. Or two. Yeah, so five hundred. Oh, I'm sorry. Two is equal to twenty one dollars. That's right. You get twenty one hundred dollars for every five hundred dollars they sell after their first fifteen thousand. Okay, so yeah, it doesn't sound like much. It's twenty one bucks, right? Who cares? All right, I get you. But now look at the next line. It adds up though. One hundred and twenty five bucks of their bonus, and then you get twenty five percent after that. So let's say in the first three months. You guys didn't sell anything. And let's say Gabriella then sold a bunch and I walked through the bonus program, right? So let's say she sold $4,000. With me so far, $2,000 up to 2,000, she doesn't get any bonus on. After that, she gets paid 10% for the first tier. So out of the 2,000, she gets paid how much? 200 bucks. How much do I get? 
up to 125% in the first three months, but we're talking about after that, I get 25%. So walk through the math with me. She sold 4,000. The first 2,000 don't count for the greatest bonus, world's greatest bonus. She sold 2,000, of which I get how much? 125%. Right, but it's 125% of what she got, her bonus. So let's try again. Let's do this. All right, can you guys see me? So yeah, you okay. get to so, she sold $4,000 in the world's greatest bonus. And I can go over this again with you guys, but the first thing you have to do is sell more than 2,000. The first 2,000 you don't get bonus on. So she sold 4,000, which means there's $2,000 she's getting bonus on, right? $2,000 in that first tier, you multiply by 10%. Her bonus then is what? Her bonus 200. is how much? 200. 200 times 10% is 200, 2,000 times 10% is $200, right? And how much do I then make out of it? 25%, right? So $200 times 0.25 is equal to what? 50 bucks, right? Everybody tracking with me on the math so far? Yeah. Anybody have any question on the math? Okay. So again, it doesn't sound like a whole lot of money, but here's what happens. That's just the first 2,000. Most of you are going to be generating in a month ALP north of 10, 15, $20,000, probably between 10 to 20. When you first start out, maybe six to eight, but you'll start to go up. And if I'm your SA, as you get better at what you do and you close at a higher level, I'm getting 25% of your world's greatest bonus. That's one person. I can have up to five. That's how you get up to 125%, right? 25, 50, 75, 100, then 125. Do you see how you start making money and you haven't had to sell anything yet? Yes, Jason. I just wanted to point out that when it talks about you get up to 125% of the world's greatest bonus during the first three months, that kind of incentivizes you to help your team during the first three months when they're starting out to be yeah. really, really good because you'll make more money helping them be successful. Absolutely. You'll make a lot of money if you're doing your job or even if you're not doing your job, but they're selling. And the best way that they can sell is with your guidance and coaching. Okay. So this is just an essay. This is just plain and simple first level promotion. And then like she was saying, if you just had one sale out of all five every single week from your people, you're going to make $82,000. Two sales, 20, or I'm sorry, 204, three sales, 331. So this guy did 209. He landed right about in the middle. Okay. So let's say he gets promoted. What does it take to get him to the next level, which is a general agent? Dina Bogdani, she's done very well in our organization. You have to have 10 sales a month. You have to have five coded agents, and then one of those have to be promoted to an SA. When they get promoted to an SA, you get promoted to a GA, general agent. Now let's look at their compensation because all of us should be able to get to an SA to do a GA, okay? They get up to 33% of what their agents get invested renewals. Holy mackerel, 33%. And then if somebody leaves the company, but their policies are still intact, you still get paid on those renewals. You get up to 35% of what the agents receive in the first 15 months and then 12.5% thereafter. Well, but an SA got 25%. Oh, wait, no, they got 4.2%. And now they're getting how much? 12 point, oh, wow. So they get three times as much payout to be a GA. They get up to 135% of their direct coded agents world's greatest bonus and then 50% thereafter. 50%, wait a minute, let me go back because this starts to get crazy. It was only 25% as an SA and now as a GA, I'm getting 50% of their bonus. So whatever my team makes from world's greatest bonus perspective, I'm going to get paid 50,000. I'm sorry, 50%. <laughs> That's for the people that are coded that you brought in, you recruited. If you didn't bring them in and recruit them, but we put a bum underneath you, then you can earn up to 50% of their 
indirect coded agents. So when you first code them for your own agents as a GA, you get up to 135% for the first three months, 50% thereafter. Anybody we put underneath you, 50%. So 135, 343, 560. If I have one agent, that doesn't mean one agent underneath me. That means as a GA, I have one supervising agent along with four uh, other agents that are coded directly to me. And then they hire somebody underneath them. Okay. How much did Dina make? She made almost $300,000. And she's at a GA. It isn't that hard to become a GA, everybody. Let's look at the next level MGA, Ari Hiro. He made $708,000 last year. How the heck did he do that? Well, he had to be an MGA. He had to qualify for that. Master general agent. Okay. And he had to add one new MGA per year to his organization. That's what the expectations are. To get there, he has to mentor one of his people to move up and achieve GA status. Right? So if you're a GA, you have to promote somebody to GA, which will allow you to get promoted to MJ. Now, how did he make all his money? Well, 100% of his coded agents and monthly renewals, 100%, 100%. So whatever the coded agents are getting in the renewals, he's getting that as well. He gets up to 50% in their first 15,000 ALP for a new agent and then 25% thereafter. Well, wait a minute. He's getting 25%, but the SA gets 50%. And then the GA gets, well, why did it drop down to 50, from 50 down to 25? That's because an MGA has a whole lot of people under him. He has a lot of people, right? Probably anywhere from 12 up to 50, if not higher. Then he gets a business builders in the first year, 150% of the world's greatest bonus if he's new for the first three months. And then 85% after that. After he's been in the company or in the role for over a year, he gets 115% in the first three months and then 65% after that. So as an MGA, you've been around for a while, you're getting 65% of whatever your agents get paid out in the world's greatest bonus. I don't know about all of you, but doing this job, you're not here to get the money from the commissions. I mean, that's nice. Don't get me wrong. You're here to get the money from the bonuses. You will always make more money in bonuses than you will in commissions. That's where the real money is. Woo! Then he gets 15% of the production growth as a quarterly MGA bonus for growth. 15%. What does that mean? What does that mean? 15% of production growth. He gets 15% of the growth of his ALP quarter over quarter. So if the first quarter he was a uh, MGA, if his production was $100,000, that's the baseline. In the second quarter, if his production was 200,000, then he received $100,000 growth. His bonus would have been $15,000 just for growing his business. And the way you grow your business is you improve close rate, you improve, uh, increase ALP, but the biggest part is recruiting and bringing more people under your organization. He gets a 20% production bonus. And then for every personal recruit, he gets 250 bucks. $250 for every single person that comes in under his team. The average is 407. How much did he make? 708. He literally blew away expectations. So why is that? Because he's part of AO International. Okay, so... Let's go back here. We all start as agents, then we become supervising agents, then we become general agents. We can all get to the general agent status. Every one of you can get there. To get to the MGA, it's a little more than just you promoting people. It's going to be about setting you up for success, and you got to be committed to the company. you got to believe in what we're doing. You have to sh shift commitment to affirmation, and you have to really work hard. There is no doubt about it. But if you do that, and you're a hustler, and you do all of that, you can get to the next level, which is an RGA, which is what Ashley Rust is at, if any of you are in our hierarchy. It's what Mark Dushai is at. It's what a number of our other folks are at, RGAs. 
Mario Hiro, he's the guy that runs AO International, of which we're all part of. Last year, he made $2 million. The average for that role is only 841. The max that we typically thought we would see is 1.4. So what does this mean? He made 2 million. Now, what did it take to get there? Okay, first he had to promote somebody to an MGA. Then the expectations are he has a minimum of 10K every month for all, for on average for all the people in his group. He gets 80% of the RGA contract. He also receives up to 50% of what they get in renewals, 105% of their business builders program, the leadership bonus. He gets all of that. Plus he gets personal production, plus he gets the MGA builder compensation plan. If you're an RGA in this business, and Mark Dushai is not shy about this at all, he'll show you his W-2s. And they go from here to here to here to here. It's ridiculous how much the guy makes in a year. Makes a lot of money. Okay. Uh, Danny was talking about the next level, which is partner. Josh Olin, he only made 1.6. Mario Hyrule only made 2 million. What's the difference? Well, Josh Olin did a really great job. We asked him to start all over again in a different area. And so he did. He's a partner. He's making tons of money. Any of us could potentially get here, but I will tell you, it takes time to get to RGA. To get to MGA, I've seen people do it in two years. GA, I've seen people do it in two months. But to get to MGA is tougher because you're building out the base. So getting to an MGA is definitely attainable, but getting above and beyond that takes a lot of time. You need to keep the people that you uh, recruit and they're part of your organization. It is the reason why this training class exists is because this gentleman right here is putting money to pay for this class because he knows the more education we give you on the front end, the better your quality business you're gonna write, the more ALP you're gonna write, the higher close rate you're gonna have, all of that translates into what? The longer you stay with us. The longer you stay with us, the more money you will eventually make, the more likely once you get past one year, you're going to stay for 10. So my whole job is to make sure I give you enough information in that toehold so that you stay for at least the one year. The managers in your upline, their job is to make sure you perform well enough that you don't want to leave and you stay for at least the 10. Any questions about any of the roles that all of you are eligible to attain? No, I'll I say, I know. Sorry, go ahead. I said, I thank you for that because it's been almost nine months I've been trying to figure this out. <laughs> oh my and gosh. now I know. Yeah. Well, we have this training class. I want to make sure everyone knows. Yes, so again, you. to get to the SA level, you need to either, in my opinion, you should recruit one person and get them into the organization. As soon as they get coded, you become an SA and you start making money outside of your personal production. Then all of you are eligible to become a GA once you promote one of those people underneath you to an SA. And then all of you are eligible to become an MGA once you promote somebody to a GA. To get beyond MGA takes time and effort. It certainly can be done. Don't get me wrong. Plenty of people have done it. But to get here, I mean, you're starting to make a lot of ridiculous money. But you live and breathe this business, just so you know. Right? I can't be an RGA right now because I'm running two other businesses. There's no way I can put my time in to do that. I just can't because I would be hustling. I'd be recruiting. I'd be doing everything under the sun. Starting next year, though, I'm going to start down my journey to go down this path because I want to get to this level. I don't necessarily want to go beyond this because I don't need that stress. I already have enough gray hair. I want to become an RGA. That is my goal. Okay, For all of you... That could be your goal. Or you could say, Sam, I don't want to be a leadership at all. I just want to make my money. Real quickly, before I let you go, let me show you what that looks like. If all you want to do is make your money, uh, sorry, not here. You can go here and we then show you. This is something you can look at, right? It's on the website. You can download it. It talks the path to partnership. But the reason I like it is it tells you if all you want to do is make your own money, you can see here, can I make this a little bit bigger for people? You can see here, just being a producer that you can continue to move up and get paid more, a much higher rate out of what you sell without ever having to go into leadership. 
So you can get to 100% if you want it, where every dollar that you book, you can get paid on, as opposed to the 50% that you're all starting out on. But again, that means that the only way you're getting paid is off your personal production, one revenue stream. For all of us that want to make money, you want to have multiple revenue streams coming in. So you can look at this at your own leisure. You can see a bunch of stuff that's in here about what you do, how you do it. And it's all starting off the dashboard that we log in on that page, business builder pathway or the path to partnership. Any questions about anything that we've spoken about today? I have somebody in the chat. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Okay, so that being the case, I'm going to stop my sharing. Has everybody had an opportunity to submit their questions for the survival and success uh, panel that we have scheduled for tomorrow? Probably around 12, mm, yeah, 12 o'clock Pacific time. Let's see here. Submissions. Has everybody submitted something? I still have to do mine. I was paying attention to you dishing yeah, no out the Bible there. That would be <laughs> great. I have 20 submissions and we have 32 people signed in right now. Holy mackerel. Do we need to put the link back up for anybody? There it is. You can click on it. Jerry, I know you need the link like five times before you get around to actually doing it, which is fine. I appreciate it, Sam. That's yeah, all good, my friend. So again, I'm passionate about what we do here. And I think it's, uh, I mean, I think all of you, how you, however you got here, the fact that you're here means you have opportunity unlimited. You'll hear that phrase uh, in what we do all the time, opportunity unlimited, because it truly is. You can make as much money as you want to make, depending upon how hard you want to work, how much you want to work. You can build your team out from one person to zero, if you don't want a team, to one person, if that's all you want, to 300 people. Okay? It is not difficult to make money in this business in terms of if you do what we ask you to do every single day. There is, when we talk tomorrow about the uh, survival and success panel, there is going to be times where you're going to be like, man, this sucks, right? And I'll give you an example. Uh, when I first started, I think I made 300 phone calls in one day, which is not bad. I mean, the goal is 250 if you don't have any appointments. So 300 was pretty good. Uh, not one person answered the phone. I'm like, okay, well, I'm in sales a long time. I get it. That's one day. I have had a whole week go by where no one has answered my calls. Because in the dog days of summer, like in August, everyone's on vacation, et cetera, et cetera. Don't get discouraged. This business is about you doing the same thing every day, day in and day out. And as you move up, if you want to move up, you'll have additional responsibilities. But if all you're doing is focusing on sales, having presentations, setting appointments, don't get discouraged by anything that happens. You're going to get people who say, yeah, I want to buy, or yeah, I'm going to be there for the appointment. They don't show up. They don't buy. You have people who say, yeah, I do buy, and then they cancel. Don't worry about that. Think in your mind that it's a numbers game. Just get enough people in front of you, get enough people to buy, do it the right way. You will make all the money that we're talking about that you can make. And again, it doesn't matter if you're 18 years old, because you have to be 18 in order to work with us, or if you're 86 years old. If you want to do this business and have this conversation from the safety of your own home office and meet with enough people, you're going to make money. And if you want to move up, you're going to make a ridiculous amount of money. I know because I have never seen compensation plans like this before. And in my career, I've created and managed compensation plans for sales organizations. I've never run a compensation plan where someone with no leadership experience whatsoever can be promoted all the way up to an MGA and make these amount of money that uh, I just showed you. Never happened. Everyone that I recruit for another job and hire have to be people who know what they're doing technically and have to have been a leader before. And now you can come in here. We teach you everything. You excel at it. You recruit people in and we're going to reward you by paying a good amount of money. Now, all that being said, all that being said, we know that at times it is not easy. Okay. Now, let's be very honest. At times it is not easy. 
it is very frustrating to spend two hours with a senior to get to the very end where you're about to do the document, so about to finish up, and they remind you, oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you, I have a pacemaker. I have a stint. I have a condition that makes me <laughs> decline. It will happen to you. It's okay. Some will, some won't. So what? Move on to the next one. You stick around long enough like I'm going to stick around and we will chat about this in the future. I may meet you at one of the uh, AO uh, travel events, vacation sprees, contests, whatever. And we'll say, hey, I remember back in the end of November, Sam, in 2022, when you were talking about this and you said, hey, don't get discouraged. And I'll tell you, in 2023, I was ready to quit, but I hung in there. Oh, you did. That's great. So what do you do now? Oh, I'm an MGA. Oh, okay. That's awesome. Glad to hear it. How, how big is your team? I have 30 people. So then I do the calculations. I know how much money you're making. I'm like, I'm glad you stuck around. So I say that to everybody because I'm passionate about it because we all have the same opportunities. We're not limited by our past. You all are getting licensed if you're not licensed already, which means you can now do this job. Everybody going forward has the same ability to make all the money that we just talked about. You just have to apply yourself. You have to be open to coaching and feedback. And remember, some will, some won't, so what? If I don't have any questions, that's all I have for you today. We will join tomorrow and we will join at 10 a.m. Pacific time because I have a small amount of information we need to go over. And then we will have the survival and success panel at 12 noon. Do I have any questions for the entire class before I stop recording? We're starting one hour late tomorrow, <laughs> just to be sure. Yes, we are starting one hour later. I will be here at nine, but everybody I expect to come in at 10 o'clock Pacific time. So it's one o'clock our time, Alex. Yeah, thank you. All right, dude. <laughs> I have like 12 o'clock widgets on my computer that I have to keep looking at. I know. I Jared, like... <laughs> do you have a question for us? Sam, can you send that form one more time? No, I'm kidding. Of course yeah. you do. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. Um, Sam, can you, uh, at some point, can you share, if you want, the um, home office setup that you have? I just feel like the the light that you have, I don't know if it's like an LED light or maybe the, you know, the the warm light that you have over there in the corner, everything makes it look so clear compared to Does what it? I personally have right now, which is... Let's see, turn that off, turn that off. Now I'm in the dark and I got this warm light over here so I can turn that on. That gives me some white that washes out. And then I have a key light over there that provides a different color. So I have that. Awesome. What I'll, do is I'll take a little video with my iPhone and I'll try to put it up. It's probably in uh, YouTube. And it will show that I've got, you know, laptops and screens and cameras. I'll, I'll, I'll do that for you. I'll do it tonight since this class uh, doesn't have a whole lot relative to recording. I'll try to get that done tonight. But yeah, I'll show you that. That'd be cool. That'd be Thank awesome. You. I'm renovating my home office because obviously I'm not going to conduct work for my couch. So <laughs> I need any good it? ideas. All right. I will definitely do that for everybody. Remember, tonight's Thursday, so what you're supposed to have done before you come to class tomorrow is your presentation rubric. If you do not have that done, you need to have it at least scheduled. And for everybody that did have their presentation rubric done, I need to get a copy of the rubric itself. So that would be filled out by your essay or your upline. They would give you a score as well as any comments. That being the case, we are all done for tonight. I will see you all again tomorrow for one last time for the AO International New Hire Class 22-016 at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Thanks, everybody.